today we are going to talk about hypothalamus right Hypo all of you know that hypothalamus is a very important area of diencephalon right and major functions of the hypothalamus basically it has three basic functions number one that it is concerned with the limbic system Lim it's part of the limbic system you know limbic system is that part of the central nervous system which is concerned with your emotions behavior and recent memory secondly hypothalamus is intimately related with the function of autonomic nervous system and thirdly hypothalamus is also a very important center in the central nervous system which is having a very powerful influence on the endocrine system so it is also having endocrine functions right so it has functions related with the part of the limbic system so it is concerned with the emotions behavior and recent memory through the autonomic nervous system it influences the sympathetic and parasympathetic output in the body and through uh, producing different releasing and release inhibiting factors for different hormones from the anterior pituitary and also releasing hormone through posterior pituitary it hypothalamus exert a very powerful control on the endocrine system in the body right so before we really go into detail first we will see exactly where the hypothalamus is situated in the central nervous system is that right first of all now we will discuss where exactly in central nervous system hypothalamus is present after that we will go into detail of hypothalamus now if i draw a central nervous system from the side right you know that here is your what is that midbrain pons medulla right spinal cord of course and now exactly where is hypothalamus let me tell you just above the midbrain there is a structure called thalamus a structure which is called thalamus right now actually antero inferior to the thalamus there is a sheet of gray matter there is a sheet of gray matter which is going anteriorly and inferiorly from the from the thalamus is that right and this structure this sheet of gray matter it is called hypothalamus and it extends from midbrain right upper part of the midbrain up to the optic chiasma it extend up to the optic chiasma right or we can say from the optic chiasma hypothalamus extend up to the yes what is this up to the midbrain or we can say up to the interpeduncular fossa and here the important structures related there is a swelling under on the under surface of the hypothalamus and from here there is the stalk and anterior pituitary and posterior pituitary this component is also the part of hypo thalamus is that right and there are bilateral swellings on posterior part and this swelling is called mammary, mammary bodies and mammary bodies are also part of hypothalamus but pituitary stalk is not the part of hypothalamus so actually hypothalamus is this structure from here right so what is this hypothalamus is mainly a sheet of gray matter extending from the optic chiasma backward up to the upper part of the midbrain right and under surface of the hypothalamus has one median swelling one central swelling called tuber cinereum and two swelling on the posterior part of the hypothalamus which can be visualized from inferior area right that is mammary body is that right this is one way to look at hypothalamus now let me draw the structure of hypothalamus with a little more detail
let me draw here your third ventricle. You remember your third ventricle? This is the roof of the third ventricle, posterior wall of the third ventricle, right? Here it is floor of third ventricle. Is that right? And you must be knowing that there's one structure on this, this side of the third ventricle. What is it? Thalamus. Very good. There's another structure on this side of the third ventricle. This is the right thalamus. Is that right? So third ventricle is in between the thalami, but it extends forward beyond the thalami. Is that right? And you must be knowing what is the structure under here? What is it? It is midbrain, right? Pons medulla, right? And all already you know there is a which nucleus here? Habenular nucleus, habenular nucleus. And here the swelling backward, what is it? Pineal body, this is habinular commissure. Is that right? Now, in this diagram, now I will draw hypothalamus. Is that right? Hypothalamus extends from here. It's a sheet of gray matter which is extending forward from the thalamus. Now, from here, what are these two? Mammillary bodies, right? And actually third ventricle extends even much farther, much interiorly. Now look, hypothalamus is basically a sheet of gray matter around this part of third ventricle. So here, this is the third ventricle, posteriorly third ventricle is surrounded by thalami, anteriorly and inferiorly third ventricle is surrounded by hypothalamus. So we can say hypothalamus is a sheet of gray matter which is present on the lateral walls of the third ventricle and in the floor of third ventricle. third ventricle. So another way to look at hypothalamus is hypothalamus is present in the lateral wall of third ventricle then inferior or the floor of the third ventricle. Is that clear? There is no problem here. Now, once you know exact position of the hypothalamus, you already know it was extending from here. What was the structure here? Yes, optic chiasma and here it was upper part of midbrain or interpeduncular fossa. Is that right? Now, any question in this orientation? Now you can see another thing, the third ventricle is in between. Some part of the hypothalamus is on the right side of the third ventricle, other part of the hypothalamus is on the left side of the third ventricle. It means hypothalamus has right area and left area. If someone can come here, yes, who want to come? Please come here. Let me give you an example exactly how is the hypothalamus. It, he's not hypothalamus. Right. No, look there, look there. Okay, yes. Now look, make a structure like this. Right. Now what we can imagine, it should be like this. Okay, like this. Okay. Now, actually, this is my, this box is, what is this? Hand is, my, this hand is? Thalamus. What is this part of my hand? Thalamus. So these are two, my hands are two? Thalami. Right? These are two? Thalami. In between, what is this structure? Third ventricle. And third ventricle having its lateral walls and the floor. What are these structures? Hypothalamus. So hypothalamus has right half and the left half. 
what is hypothalamus is a sheet of gray matter here and sheet of gray matter here right surrounding interior part of the third ventricle, ventricle. and what is the structure here optic chiasma. optic chiasma and now you come from here from the optic chiasma suppose this was your eyeballs here come the optic chiasma right optic chiasma moves backward as optic tract now from here this is the sur under surface of what is this under surface of hypothalamus and this is ventricular surface of hypothalamus this is the inferior surface of hypothalamus now if you move in inferior surface backward it become it make a central swelling like this the central swelling is called tuber cinereum the central swelling come down and make a longitudinal stalk we call it in fundibulum or posterior in fundibulum or stalk of pituitary which convert into anterior pituitary and posterior pituitary then here was the tuber cinereum and then we move a little more posteriorly you will find that there is a one mammillary swelling on the right side and other mammillary swelling is on the left side so what are mammillary bodies these are masses of gray matter which can be seen on the posterior part on the posterior part of hypothalamus from inferior aspect and there are two swellings one right mammillary body and the left mammillary body so one central swelling what is that tuber cinereum and two paramedian swellings which are mammillary body is that right now thank you now you will tell me what are the structure i'm going to tell you now if i say the my this is my right hand and this is my left of course you are intelligent to understand it right now these two surfaces this is making hypothalamus now what are the structure here and here thalami is that right these are thalami what is the structure crossing here optic chiasma what is the central swelling here tuber cinereum going down as in fundibulum and then Anterior pituitary, posterior pituitary, and on the back there is a swelling here, and there is a swelling here. What are these? Mammillary body. Just on the back, what is here? Midbrain. Any question about it? So you exactly know where is the hypothalamus present, and of course you can understand hypothalamus has left sheet and right sheet, left side and the right side. Any question up to this? There is no question. Okay. You know, hypothalamus is very small area. The weight of hypothalamus is just four grams. Four grams means it is equal to the nail of your little finger. But it influences every tissue from head to toe through autonomic nervous system or and through endocrine system. Now you will recognize these structures. What is this? This is midbrain, and what is it under it? Pons, superior colliculi inferior. Is that right? Now, where is exactly hypothalamus in this relation? Look here. Hypothalamus will start from here, and from here. It will extend of course I have made it out of proportion can you understand How, what is the exact location of hypothalamus that when you are going on the back it is fusing with the midbrain is that right now this part of the midbrain this part of the midbrain is called interpeduncular fossa so it is coming up to that it is coming extending up to interpeduncular fossa this is left side of the hypothalamus this is the right side of hypothalamus any question here there is no now i will draw the structures and you will name them why well, I am putting so much time in orientation of where is hypothalamus because in my career I came across many doctors 
who knew a lot about hypothalamus, but if you ask them where in the central nervous system hypothalamus is, they start looking at your nose. Yes. They don't know. What is it? Mammillary bodies. Of course, this is from the top and this is from the side. And what is this structure? Yes, tuber. Cinerium. Very good. And what is this structure? Infundibulum. And this is posterior pituitary. Here is anterior pituitary. And what is this here? Third ventricle is that right and this is which part of the hypothalamus left side and this is right side any question up to this and of course you are so intelligent you must be knowing that what is the structure here yes clear no problem okay from here if I raise this area Okay, I will do that later. What is here? Thalamus. And what is this? This is of course, this is the lateral wall of hypothalamus or we can say actually this is hypothalamus on the lateral left lateral side of the third ventricle and if I make here this structure do you understand what is it and then yes what is this right half of the hypothalamus left half of the hypothalamus under surface of the hypothalamus. Any question? There is no question. Okay. Right. Now we will, if someone asks you that identify the under structures, what is this structure? Optic chiasma. What is this structure? Tuber cinerium. In that, this all is tuber cinerium. In the tuber cinerium, this swelling is called median swelling. What is it? Mammillary body. Is that right? No problem? Okay. After this, now we go into detailed structure of hypothalamus. Now I will draw on the board only hypothalamus and we will see that what are the details of hypothalamus. Now, of course, you know what is it, right? There is no need to ask you again, I hope. Am I clear? And what was this? Third ventricle. Is that right? Now, you have to tell me what it is. Let's hope who can identify it. What is it? It is fornix.
Now what we really see that fornix is originating from parahippocampal formation. In the parahippocampal formation, right, fornix derives most of its fibers from a special area which is called, that special area is called subiculum, right? From subiculum, with special area in parahippocampal formation, most of the fibers originate and they become the part of, yes, fornix. Is that right? And fornix as it moves backward, then upward, and then forward, and then eventually downward, and it embeds into substance of, substance of thalamus. It embeds, it enters into substance of thalamus. Is that right? And this in the same way, there is, this was the right fornical system, there is also, yes, left fornical system. And it embeds in which hypothalamus? Left side of the hypothalamus. Is this structure clear to your mind? What is happening? That parahippocampal formation gives rise to the fornix, which is a bundle of what? White. Of course, a bundle of white matter, right? And these neuronal fibers move from the parahippocampal formation backward, upward, forward, and eventually downward, and again backward, and it embeds into the embeds into the hypothalamus. Of course, there is one right fornix and there is left fornix. Both of them enter into right and left part of hypothalamus. Now, within the hypothalamus, now listen very, very carefully. Yes, this is one mammillary body and this is other mammillary bodies. Is that right? Actually, once the right fornix enters to right side of the hypothalamus, then within this, within the substance, it moves up to mammillary body. And now, it has arrived into mammillary nuclei. This is the right side. In the same way in the left side also, it passes through the substance of the hypothalamus and eventually it reaches, yes, where? Mammal left mammillary body. Am I clear? And some of you must be knowing that there is a very important structure here. I will give it a different color and this structure is, okay, I will make it brown colored. And of course, you will immediately recognize that structure, yes, thalami, right? And you must be knowing that from the mammillary body, a very important relationship, yes, what is this? From the mammillary body, what is this pathway? Mamilla thalamic fibers and from here also there will be which fiber? Mamilla thalamic fibers. Any question up to this? Now you may be wondering why I'm specially drawing this specially fornical system that how parahippocampal system goes into mammillary body and then from, from mammillary body there is mammillothalamic tract. What's the importance of this drawing? Actually, I want to tell you something very important and that is that if you take that this is the middle of the, this is the right half of the hypothalamus and here it is. What is this? 
This is the right half of the hypothalamus and this is the left half of the hypothalamus. Actually where the fornix enters, it hypothetically divides the right hypothalamus into lateral and medial area. In the same way left fornix divides the left side of the hypothalamus into medial and lateral area. Right? So what we can see here now that this part of hypothalamus This, uh, this part of the hypothalamus is called, yes, right medial hypothalamus. In the same way, there must be, what is it? Left medial hypothalamus. Thalamus. Is that right? So there is a right hypothalamus and there is left hypothalamus, right? And both have the hypothalamic substances are receiving the fornix and releasing what? Mamillothalamic tract. Is that right? Fornix and mamillothalamic tract divide the one side of hypothalamus into lateral area and medial area. Is that right? So here is your, what is it? This is right lateral hypothalamus. And what is this? This is left lateral hypo thalamus. So what did we learn up to now? That hypothalamus is a sheet of gray matter on the lat interior part of lateral wall of third ventricle and also floor of the third ventricle. And hypothalamus is as right half and the left half. Is that right? And both half of the hypothalamus are divided into medial and lateral side by an imaginary plane which is demarcated by entrance of the fornix and exit of mamillothalamic tract. Any question up to this? Yes. There is no question? What do you think in hypothalamus the happiness area and sadness area? or not? Yeah, it has some areas related with the emotion, reward centers and punishment centers. We will talk about that later. Once we have learned up to now, now we will go detailed structure of the lateral hypothalamus and medial hypothalamus. But before really I go into detail, I will draw hypothalamus here and I just want to be sure that you can identify the structures rapidly. Yes, please. Mammillary bodies. Mammillary bodies. Rapidly, please. Third ventricle. And rapidly, please. What is embedding here? Fornix left and what is coming here? Fornix right and what is coming out from here yes mamillo thalamic and now you will tell me yes what is it left medial hypothalamus and what is the structure here right medial hypothalamus and now as I know that you are a very good student, so you must be able to tell me what is this structure? Left lateral hypothalamus and what is the structure here? 
right lateral any problem no okay now we will make our study first of all we will study about the now now onward the lecture in the lecture i will remove this component from diagram i will remove the right hypothalamus this sheet of gray matter will be removed so what you will be visualizing left hypothalamus from the medial side you will be now visualizing the left hypothalamus from the medial side right so let's draw that structure Okay. Yes, what is this component? Left lateral. And what is uh, this component? Left medial. Is that right? Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to remove this part. Is that right? Now, what part is left in the diagram? Only the left side of hypothalamus. And even I remove this ventricular area, even I remove this medial area. Now what is left here? Left side of lateral You understand what is the structure? The structure is the left hypothalamus lateral side. And here is the medial side. Now here there is a very important thing that within this a very special type of bundle moves. I think I should, there is a very special type of white fiber bundle moves. I will make a smaller diagram so that this aspect become more clear. I hope you understand these structures. I want to draw another group of fibers so that they don't confuse you later. Yes, what is this part? Lateral part of right and left. And this is of course, yes, medial part of left and this is the medial part of left and this is the medial part of Right. Up to now, how many bundles you have seen? White matter bundle, fornix coming from here and going to the mammillary body, and mammillothalamic. No problem. Now, actually, a very important bundle of fibers which is moving from the pre. There is, you know. Temporal lobe here, temporal lobe, temporal lobe as orbital surface, right? Sorry, it is not temporal lobe, it is frontal lobe. What happened to you? Just like me, it's frontal lobe. Frontal lobe as orbital surface. So frontal orbital surface give rise to certain fibers. What is this fiber coming from the frontal orbital area? And these fibers are also coming from, yes, frontal 
orbital area. Here there are some fibers coming from the top and they are coming from the septal area. Septal area. Now you may be thinking what is septal area? Let me show you what is septal area. I hope you recognize this structure. Clear? In this structure, this third. This area, this area is called septal area. And here in the front, there is frontal lobe. You get it? And frontal lobe. So these fibers which I am showing you, they are originating from fibers from here and also from septal area. So front orbital and septal area. Then they are passing through the hypothalamus. Now these fibers are going backward through the hypothalamus but through the lateral part of hypothalamus or medial? Very good. They are passing through the lateral part of hypothalamus. So these are fibers which are traversing anteroposteriorly through the lateral part of hypothalamus. When they will come here, can you recognize this structure? What is it? Midbrain, Mid isn't it? And this is pons. These fibers, yes, these fibers are passing through the lateral hypothalamus and eventually going into brain stem. Here also coming from frontal orbital cortex, from the septal area, right? And they are passing through the lateral hypothalamus and eventually going to the brain stem. What is this bundle called? This, this and this going here. It means fibers which are passing through the lateral hypothalamus. Who is going to tell me? Yes, please. Listen, first of all, you should know fornix and mamillothalamic tract. They divide the hypothalamus into medial and lateral. And through the lateral, some fibers are moving anteroposteriorly. This is very important bundle. It is connecting the frontal orbital cortex, septal area, many thalamic nuclei, and eventually to the brain stem. All of you have heard the name of this bundle. Lateral? No, 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 no. You just heard something lateral, you thought it must be in the lateral hypothalamus. Anyone else? What is this called? Yes. This bundle which is passing through the lateral hypothalamus is called, it is called medial forebrain bundle. It is not called lateral, but of course it is passing through the lateral, but this is called medial forebrain bundle. Have you heard of it? But there are books called uh, smells. In those books it is mentioned in neuroanatomy. What is this? Yes, medial forebrain bundle. Later on we will discuss this in detail, right? For a, what I just wanted to tell up to now, you should know three white bundle fibers in relation to hypothalamus. Fornix and mamillothalamic, we divide the hypothalamus into medial and lateral side and then within the lateral part of the hypothalamus, anteroposteriorly fibers are moving which are called medial forebrain bundle. Any question up to this? There is no question. Okay. Now we go in detail of lateral hypothalamus. And of course, medial hypothalamus also, and their nuclei, and their functions, and their lions. So we are talking about hypothalamus, and now we are going into detail of hypothalamic nuclei and their function, right? As you know, if I draw the hypothalamus like this. Of course, the central area is what? Yes, 
third ventricle and around the third ventricle. What is this area? Lateral or medial? Medial and around that, what will be this area? Lateral? Yes, lateral hypothalamus, right? Now, I will talk in detail the functions of the lateral hypothalamus, right? Number one, there is a nucleus not supraoptic, rather preoptic. The preoptic nuclei and these preoptic nuclei are extending like this. What does it mean? The preoptic nuclei, yes, are having some portion in the lateral hypothalamus and some portion in the medial hypothalamus. Is that right? What is the function of the preoptic nuclei? No. They are very sexy. You don't know. Anyone who knows about the function of the preoptic nucleus? There is a very special nucleus within it. There is a very, very special nucleus within the preoptic area. And this very special nucleus is called, yes, this nucleus is called dimorphic nucleus. You must be guess. And if you really want to remember their function, you can make something like this there. I hope this is something and all of you know what I'm making. What does it mean? Male and female, yes. This nucleus has something to do with the sexual activity. Is that right? Pre-optic nuclei have some sexual activity. How? They influence your sexual activity. They release, preoptic nuclei can release special type of chemical compounds and these compounds can go into what was here swelling, median eminence and then through blood supply from this area, this is a blood supply, special channels, these compounds can go into interior. Interior pituitary and when these compounds come into interior pituitary they stimulate special type of cells and these cells can release FSH and LH. What is FSH? Follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone and in females Follicle stimulating hormone will act on the ovaries and produce the formation of follicles and ova, maturation of ova. And LH will lead to luteinization and ovum release. So basically, FSH and LH will go and work on, yes please, rapidly on the ovaries in the female. And then ovaries, follicular maturation will occur and they will produce estrogen and, yes, progesterone. So look at it. That if there is no estrogen and progesterone in a female, will female look like a female? No, no yes, beautiful breast and these hips, all these things and many other features and axilla hair, pubic hair and other details which you know. They are, many of them are due to estrogen and progesterone, right? They are produced by the ovaries. But ovaries are under influence of FSH and LH produced by anterior pituitary. And FSH and LH are produced by the interior pituitary under the influence of certain substances which are produced by these nuclei. So preoptic nuclei release special factors, right? And these factors act on interior pituitary and then interior pituitary hormones can go to the ovaries and produce ovarian hormones. Is that right? So ovaries are female gonads. So we call these factors gonadotropic releasing hormones. What are these? Or gonadotropin gonadotropin releasing factors. 
we also call it FSH releasing factor and LH releasing factor. So from the hypothalamus, follicle stimulating hormone releasing factors are produced, luteinizing hormone releasing factors are produced and they act on the GF pituitary, produce FSH and LH which is going to work on the ovaries. Is that right? No problem. So they are related with the sexual development of males or females? Females. Then what about males? Do you think males should have these nuclei? Yes, 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 males should have. And males nuclei should produce which substance? Same substance. Gonadotropin releasing factors. And in the male interior pituitary, what substance should be produced? Males produce which hormone in the place of FSH? My question is, male anterior pituitary, does anterior pituitary in the male produce FSH and LH? Yes. Answer is yes. yes. Actually, follicle stimulating hormone was originally discovered in females. And it was found that this hormone stimulates the development of follicles in ovaries. Later on, we discovered that this hormone acts on the male testes. Males don't have ovaries, right? So in the males, testes. And there it helps in the development of spermatozoa. Is that right? And FSH and LH, when they act on the testes, they help in the development of male gonads, testes, and development of a spermatozoa, and production of testosterone. Is that right? So, this is a very small nucleus present in the hypothalamus, right, called preoptic nucleus, a little present in lateral hypothalamus, most of it present in medial hypothalamus, and it produces what? Gonadotropin releasing factors, which influence the produ production of FSH LH from anterior pituitary, which eventually affect the gonadal development in males and females. Is that clear? Now, I said within this, within this nuclear area, there's a very special nucleus. What is this? This is called dimorphic, sexually dimorphic nucleus. Within this nucleus, this, okay, I'll make it like a blue star. A very special area in pre-optic area. These blue stars are what? Sexually dimorphic nucleus <laughs> yes you know what is the function of this nucleus anyone there are so many doctors and young doctors old doctors medical students pardon this is sexually dimorphic nucleus no he is saying it is secondary sexual characteristics. Of course, secondary sexual characteristics are made by the uh, gonadal uh, heart testosterone in the male and female estrogen progesterone. Okay, let me tell you something. Some people believe that your sexual orientation, you like males or females? You like males? Okay. okay, he is male and these days he likes females, right? Okay, so you are heterosexual, yes. right? But there are some people who are homosexual, is that right? They have found that the people who are homosexual, they have different development of sexually dimorphic nucleus. Is that right? That in homosexuals, the men who are in love with the men, sexually in love with the men, and women who are sexually in love with women, lesbians, or male homosexuals, they are having Problem with the develop, we cannot say problem because some homos may put a case on me. Uh, I must say they have something different in this nucleus, sexually dimorphic nucleus. And you know, sexually dimorphic nucleus develops in at what time? When you are still within the uterus of your own mother. Usually you have been in the uterus of your own mother, isn't it? So, when you are in the uterus of your own mother, of course, you were a fetus and your hypothalamus was developing at that time when pre-optic area was developing, the sexually dimorphic nucleus was developing. The development of this nucleus at that time was under the control of, yes, Dr. Nuri, under the control of 
androgens in the mother. Right? Mothers don't have a lot of testosterone. They are female. They have a lot of estrogen progesterone. But fetus produces its own testosterone. Right? And testosterone level in the fetus determines the development of these dimorphic nuclei. Is that right? So sometimes tendency to be homosexual are embedded within the brain of a fetus before, before even fetus has born and before a fetus has seen, seen any male or female person. Am I clear? Any question here? There's no question. Okay. So this was something about then there is a another nucleus here in the lateral hypothalamus and this is called yes there is a very important nucleus here and this nucleus is part of lateral hypothalamus do you think this nucleus looks happy or it looks unhappy it is looking unhappy nucleus in the lateral hypothalamus and this lateral hypothalamic lateral hypothalamic nucleus it's looking angry or sad Angry, angry man is here raised, right? And of course, there's one nucleus like this here also. This is lateral hypothalamic nucleus. This lateral hypothalamic nucleus, when it is stimulated, anyone? Have you heard of, actually when you stimulate it, you feel hungry. When you stimulate it, you feel hungry. Actually, when you feel you are hungry, actually there are more action potential in these areas. So we, we can also call these nuclei hunger center. These are the hunger center in your brain. When these areas are stimulated, you feel hungry and you want to eat more. Is that right? And if they are too much stimulated, you also feel angry. You know, hungry man is an angry man. Hungry man is an angry man because areas of hunger and anger are very near to each other areas of hunger and anger are very near to each other so when action potential in hunger area become too much they also stimulate the circuits of anger that is why usually hungry people are angry people and you know men are very clever when they want to propose a woman for marriage or for something else first they take them to the mid midnight dinner what is the advantage of that dinner? They are giving them the food. So that hunger center should become off and anger center should become off. And later on I will tell you, when you have eaten enough, when you have eaten enough, there is another center here on the... Yes, medial side. And this center, in the medial hypothalamus, when you keep on eating, when you are full, this area becomes very active. And this area becomes off. And this area, which is in the medial hypothalamus, which is also called ventromedial nucleus. I will go into detail later. Ventromedial nucleus. This ventromedial nucleus in the medial hypothalamus, when it is stimulated, you feel you are full. You don't want to eat anymore. You feel that you don't want to eat anymore. For example, before you go to the dinner, this center is firing. And when you have taken a, taken a very good dinner, you have taken good food, then these centers become off and these centers become on. These centers are not only center for satisfaction that you have eaten enough, when you are satisfied that you have eaten enough and you don't want to eat anymore, we call this situation satiety. What we call it? satiety and this satiety situation is this from this nucleus so these nuclei are also called satiety center so what are these red nuclei hunger center and what are these nuclei satiety center is that right and hunger centers are also anger center and satiety center are centers for happiness that is why when you've eaten full you feel happy why? Because satiety center is having a lot of action potential and they are also going to the nearby area and they, these areas when stimulated, they give you a feeling of happiness. Is that right? 
scientists have done something interesting. They caught some monkeys or some rats, some animals, and electrically started stimulating this area. They are electrical stimulation. So these animals will feel all the time hungry and angry. And they will keep on eating and eating and eating. And they will become very obese. Right? So this is one experiment which tells the function of this, these two nuclei, hunger center. That if hunger centers are electrically stimulated too much, <coughs> then animals, of course we are also animals, animals will keep on eating and their hunger center will be not satisfied. And with that, after eating, will they feel good? No, no because hunger center is all the time stimulated electrically. Right? You can imagine, here is a cage and here is a monkey. Right? And you have given some electrical connection to his brain. And you are stimulating these nuclei. This monkey will keep on eating, keep on eating until it become a monkey like this. <laughs> and still it will be an angry monkey. Is that right? Now, but if you destroy these nuclei, if you electrically not stimulate it, but destroy it, if these two nuclei are not there, will the animal ever feel hunger? And animal will keep on waiting, uh, uh, keep on losing the weight, but animal will not eat. You bring the best of your food, but animal will not eat. And uh, animal will develop anorexia, no wish to eat. Is that right? So what we can say, another interesting thing, this area is not only hunger area and anger area, but it is also for thirst. The neurons which are present here, some of them are stimulated when you are hungry, some of them are stimulated when you are angry, some of them are stimulated when you are thirsty, when you are feeling thirsty, right? So when you feel thirsty and you are looking for the water, actually these lateral hypothalamic nuclei are stimulated. When you are very hungry, lateral hypothalamic nuclei are stimulated and in anger also they are stimulated. Am I clear? And another very important thing. Just behind it, there are diffused neurons, right? And these neurons, whenever these are stimulated, your sympathetic nervous system activity goes up. And you know when your sympathetic nervous system activity goes up, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, your hair stand up, your GIT becomes slow, you are understanding? So actually, hunger center, anger center, thirst center are very near to those part of the hypothalamus which are concerned with sympathetic outflow. That is why a person who is very hungry, with little irritation, he becomes very angry and his sympathetic nervous system will be very aroused. So what happens? The men and women who are very intelligent, they know how to use these areas. For example, when you want to really propose a woman and she is not willing to marry you, you can take her to the good dinner, you can fill her properly with very good food, Right, then her stity center is very happy, this center is off, her sympathetic nervous system is down, and then you ask and you make your dangerous proposal. <laughs> is that right? In the same way, once you are really married to her, maybe later on you forget to take her to dinner, but she knows if one day she is going to make a lot of demands from you, that day when you come home, if she is intelligent, she will make a very good dinner for you and she will push you to eat and eat and eat and you say no I have eaten enough, she say no I am not cooking good, you say no no you are cooking good, you again eat until hunger center is totally off, anger center is totally off, sympathetic nervous system is down and stity center is very active, you feel happy and then she, she says what do you think you can take some loan from bank for my jewelry? <laughs> you, you know how to work but there are people who are not very intelligent there may be a wife who sees you are very angry at the same time she makes some too much demands <laughs> and you know then your this area becomes you bring your nails out, teeth out, right? So what I'm saying, all these areas are interconnected with each other in their function. Am I clear? Then, so this was main function of the lateral hypothalamus. Right, yes please. Yes, hypoglycemia. 
Very good. Relation. He has seen the patients of hypoglycemia. In hypoglycemia, blood sugar level goes very much down. When your blood sugar level goes very much down, in the hunger center and striety center, there are special receptors which are called glucoreceptors. There are special neurons here and here. And these neurons can sample the blood and tell what is the level of glucose in the blood. Right? If glucose level in the blood go very much down, is that right? Stritty center stop working and hunger center start working. And when this lateral hypothalamus come, become very active as glucose level keep on going down and down, first you feel hunger, then you feel anger and then sympathetic overflow. That is why the clinical features of low blood glucose is sweating, tremors, tachycardia, irritability. All these are due to overstimulation of sympathetic nervous system. So overflow of sympathetic nervous system may be caused by hypoglycemia. Let's have a break now. Right, so we were talking about hypothalamus and we have discussed about the lateral hypothalamus, right? Now we will discuss in detail medial part of hypothalamus. So let me draw a structure here about the medial part of hypothalamus. As you know, here is your optic chiasma, right? And optic chiasma on one side is connected to one eyeball through the optic nerve and other side this is other eyeball. Now, Hypothalamus is extending from the optic chiasma. Here is a part of hypothalamus. Yes, what is this median? Yes, tubercinerium. And then here is mammillary body. And here is midbrain and Pons. And here yes. This is infundibulum. And here is interior pituitary and there is posterior pituitary. Now I'm showing the medial side of the left hypothalamus, right? In this case, first of all, we'll decide the regions on the medial side, right? What is this area I'm showing? Medial side. If it is the third ventricle, this is the This medial side, I'm going to show, third ventricle has been removed here, right? Now, this area is called pre-optic region. What is it? Pre-optic pre region. And area from here, this is called, yes. Supra optic region. So, what we can see that on the medial side, hypothalamus is divided into different regions from front to the back. There is pre optic region, then there is supra optic region, and this is tuber cinerium. So, area all of this area is yes, tubral tubral region and this area in the end is yes mammillary region. So what we can see that medial hypothalamus here is the medial hypothalamus and here it is lateral hypothalamus right. This diagram which is made here large that is this part of the medial hypothalamus, right? As we see, medial hypothalamus is divided into, yes, 
Now you will tell me again, what is this area? If I remove this part, third ventricle, pre optic region, then there is supra optic, then there is tubural region, and in the end, mammillary region. Any question up to this? Right now. I will talk about the nuclei in this area, right? The most important nucleus in preoptic region is preoptic nucleus. You remember in previous diagram I showed you that preoptic nucleus was extending from lateral side to the medial side. So preoptic nucleus has some part extending into lateral hypothalamus and some part extending into medial hypothalamus. So here is which part of the preoptic nucleus? Medial part of the preoptic nucleus. You remember there was some very special nucleus here. What was it? Sexually dimorphic nucleus. And I have put it like that. Yes. And what was the most important product it was producing? Gonadotropin releasing factors. Right? This is what we discussed in the previous part of the lecture also. Right? Now we come to which, what is this area? Supraoptic region. In the supraoptic uh, region, there are multiple nuclei. Uh, one nucleus, I will make it here. And Yes, this nucleus looks like a clock. This is a nucleus which looks like a clock. This nucleus is, this nucleus just above the chiasma. So it is also called suprachiasmatic nucleus. What is it called? Suprachiasmatic nucleus. Who will tell me the function of suprachiasmatic nucleus? and connections of suprachiasmatic nucleus. Yes, who is going to tell me about the suprachiasmatic nucleus? Anyone? Okay, I will ask you something very simple. Have you seen that there are uh, some rhythms in our body, biological rhythm, which are according to day and night, and according to the season, we call them circadian rhythms. What are they? Circadian? rhythms. Is that right? Actually, do you know we have internal biological clock that is through this suprachiasmatic nucleus. For example, there are certain, some birds which will give eggs in a specific season. How the bird know that that specific season has come? Do they come to you and read from the Wikipedia? Or they are reading the, looking on the TV, on the CNN report of the weather. Now spring has come and we should give the eggs. How the birds know? Actually, what happens in the bird, how a bird knows this is summer season. Actually, all the light which is going to their eyes, right, through this pathway, through the chiasma, there are special fibers which are connecting to suprachiasmatic nucleus. And actually, when light is passing through the visual pathway, connections are going to suprachiasmatic nucleus, and suprachiasmatic nucleus can determine that in 24 hours, how much time it was the light and how much time it was the darkness. So it can determine the ratio of light and darkness and the ratio of light and darkness mean ratio of the daytime daylight and night it can determine different seasons actually this nucleus suprachiasmatic nucleus is connected through special pathway to the habinular nucleus and pineal gland and pineal gland is concerned with circadian rhythms it tells you when it is morning when it should be morning when it should be night you know, when you travel through the airlines, there is jet lag. Jet lag, why? 
because your body has adjusted with certain day and night rhythm and suprachiasmatic nucleus with pineal body and other part of central nervous system is controlling your body rhythms related with the day and night. So what happens when you travel from for example New York to the Tokyo the time zone is changed daylight and night ratio is disturbed for you and suprachiasmatic nucleus and pineal gland gets upset. Is that right? So basically your circadian rhythms, what are circadian rhythms? These are biological rhythms in our body which are dependent on day and night. Is that right? Circadian rhythm control is mainly done by suprachiasmatic nucleus in association with the pineal gland and suprachiasmatic nucleus has special connection with the chiasma and from chiasma few fibers go to the suprachiasmatic nucleus and suprachiasmatic nucleus can determine the ratio between the light and darkness and then control the circadian rhythms. Am I clear to everyone? No problem here, right? Then we have one more nucleus here. There is a nucleus here. What is this nucleus? This nucleus is like air conditioner. Right? It is. Yes. What is the name of this nucleus and what is the function of this nucleus? The name of this nucleus is anterior thalamic nucleus. What is the name of this nucleus? Anterior thalamic nucleus. Right? And function of this nucleus is it controls your temperature and specially it does not allow your body temperature to go high when temperature of the environment is high. For example, you are sitting in a room where air conditioner is working very well. Suddenly light goes and room becomes warm, rather hot. Now this your internal air conditioning system will keep you cool. Your body temperature will still, still remain 37, 37 centigrade or 98.6 Fahrenheit. Now body temperature is not allowed to go above this due to the presence of the function of this nucleus. This nucleus does not allow the body temperature to go high when the environmental temperature goes up. So in a way it is anti-rise center. It does not allow the body temperature to rise with the environment. Now how it keeps your body temperature 37. Let's suppose in the environment temperature is 42. If environmental temperature is 42, it's very hot. But human body temperature still remain 37. How it keep the body cool? Actually from this nucleus, anterior hypothalamic nucleus, what really happens, the fibers going backward into brain stem and then going into spinal cord to the all body and those fibers are connected with the sweat glands those fibers are connected with the sweat gland so what happens when temperature goes up this nucleus orders the body to sweat so sweating start when sweating start when air will pass by water will evaporate it will take some temperature away and you will be kept cool so it is your internal cooling system, cooling regulator that whenever temperature is very high this nucleus will start give the order for sweating. Is that right? Secondly, through this nucleus fibers will go and produce the dilation of the cutaneous blood vessels. Blood vessels on the skin will dilate and blood flow to skin will be more so that warm blood come near the skin and temperature is, heat is dissipated. So this nucleus which is called anterior hypothalamus nucleus it, reg it is part of the temperature regulating mechanism we can say it's part of the hypothalamic thermostat as in the refrigerator there is a thermostat in our hypothalamus there is also thermostat which keeps your body temperature at 37 this part of hypothalamic th thermostat 
is also called anti rise center it does not allow the body temperature to rise pathologically whenever environmental temperature goes up it will start the sweating and it will start the cutaneous vasodilation so that temperature heat should be lost out of the body am i clear along with that this center is also concerned with parasympathetic functions it is also concerned with parasympathetic functions so this uh, has a para sympathetic nervous system functions because you know when parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated you can go for micturition defecation git movement these heart rate will become slow you know the functions of parasympathetic nervous system parasympathetic nervous system can slow down the heart right it can increase the movement of the git parasympathetic nervous system can increase the movement of the git can produce defecation it can produce the contraction of the urinary bladder produce micturition so if you really stimulate this neuron too much number one body will sweat sweating will start and cutaneous blood vessels will dilate plus stimulation of this will produce micturition and defecation and heart rate will become slow is that right so th what is the name of this nucleus anterior, anterior hypothalamic nucleus when anterior hypothalamic nucleus is damaged for example in a person due to some cancer or due to some blood supply disturbance this nucleus is damaged what will happen to your body temperature regulation will be disturbed it means your air conditioner regulator is disturbed and what can you sweat so in warm temperature when you cannot sweat you cannot produce sweating and you cannot dilate the cutaneous blood vessels it means you cannot get rid of your body heat so body temperature will go up and you will have a trouble called hyperthermia so hypothalamic lesions which involve this what is this anterior thalamic nucleus they may lead to hyperthermia any question up to this there is no question then there is another nucleus there and that nucleus which is present over here yes there is another nucleus here and i have made this nucleus in the shape of a kidney why because this nucleus is producing urine no it is not producing urine i hope your brain is not having urine yes oh it is not producing aldosterone it is producing a hormone this is actually a neuron there is a group of neurons and these neurons synthesize anti diuretic hormone mainly 90% of anti diuretic hormone is produced by this neuron and this group of neurons the nucleus also produces little oxytocin but mainly it is responsible to produce anti diuretic hormone anti diuretic hormone is produced by supra optic nucleus what is this nucleus supra optic nucleus so supra optic nucleus in the supra optic region produces synthesizes what adh and then anti diuretic hormone which is a peptide moves down through its axons this is a neuron and through the axons this hormone in association with special type of proteins these proteins with which the hormone come down those proteins are called neurophysins what are those proteins called neurophysins so adh in association with neurophysins is produced by the supra optic nucleus and neurons and from those neurons through special nerve fibers it goes downward and backward and eventually adh reaches to posterior pituitary gland and in the posterior pituitary adh is stored into these vesicles adh is stored into these vesicles and what happens 
when you are not drinking water when you are not drinking water right then what happens if you are sweating and not drinking water your blood will become more concentrated blood will become hyper osmolar then some of the neurons here work as osmoreceptor they work as osmoreceptors so when your blood osmolality goes up osmoreceptors are stimulated they produce action potential in supraoptic nuclei and action potentials go down and release the ADH into blood. Antidiuretic hormone through the blood can go to the kidney and in the kidney in the nephrons it work on the last part of the nephron which is called distal convoluted tubule and collecting tubule. ADH hormone will work on the cells on distal convoluted tubule and collecting tubule and make this part of this part of the nephron more permeable to water more permeable to water and water will be reabsorbed so it is this is a hormone water will come down out and do you think water will go into urine now no water is reabsorbed so urine will become less or more so what happens when you are not drinking water blood become concentrated osmoreceptor detect that blood is hyperosmolar they stimulate the supraoptic nucleus that uh, releases the preformed and pre-stored ADH antidiuretic hormone in the blood which act on the uh, distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct of the nephrons and make them very permeable to water and water is reabsorbed back to the body and urine is having less water and become urine become concentrated so it is an attempt to conserve the water so that water should not be lost in urine but when you drink a lot of water for example you keep on drinking a lot of water someone says he will give you one dollar if you drink 10 glasses of water what happened you drink a lot of water water goes to the blood osmoreceptor sense that osmolality of blood is down so osmoreceptor become inhibited they don't stimulate this and this hormone is not released and in the absence of this hormone when this hormone is not there this part of the nephron is not permeable to water so most of the filter uh, uh, most of the water in the lumen of nephron which come here cannot be reabsorbed and goes into urine so when you are drinking more water urine you will pass more urine is that right moreover antidiuretic hormone also has receptors on the blood vessels on the smooth muscles of blood vessels and if antidiuretic hormone bind here blood vessels constrict in high concentration antidiuretic hormone can produce vasoconstriction that is why this hormone is also called vasopressin so vasopressin is the other name for which hormone antidiuretic hormone so we can say where the antidiuretic hormone is produced supraoptic nucleus mainly and where it is stored in posterior pituitary and when it is released it release depend on the action of osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus am i clear so in supraoptic nucleus how many nuclei we have discussed suprachiasmatic nucleus concerned with circadian rhythm interior hyp hypothalamic nucleus concerned with the temperature regulation does not allow the body temperature to go up keeps the body cool in high environmental temperature plus parasympathetic activation and supraoptic nucleus which is mainly concerned with production of ADH. ADH right and then there is a very important nucleus here okay I hope you can recognize it what is it it's a woman you feel in hypothalamus there is a woman what is that but do you think there can be breast in hypothalamus no so why I have really made this diagram yes very good this is a nucleus which produces yes what happened to you people you feel excited isn't it I'm surprised even a little stimulation can excite you and what is this this is uterus which is found only in females okay you have good general knowledge now 
breast and the uterus, both of them are not there in the hypothalamus, of course. <laughs> but this nucleus is called paraventricular nucleus because it is just on the side of the third ventricle. Let me tell you that if we, this is the third ventricle, right? Here is your, which part of hypothalamus? Medial part of hypothalamus. This nuclei is here and here. So because on the side of the ventricle, they are called paraventricular nucleus. Paraventricular nucleus, the neurons in paraventricular nucleus produce very special type of hormone and that hormone from these neuronal cells goes down to where? Posterior pituitary, right? And this hormone which is produced by paraventricular nucleus, mostly this hormone is produced by paraventricular nucleus, this hormone is called oxytocin. Oxytocin also goes down in association with neurophysins. As ADH was going with neurophysins, oxytocin also goes in association with neurophysins. And through these neurons, these neurons are very long axon which end up into nerve ending in posterior pituitary. And in the vesicle, this is a hormone stored. What is the name of this hormone? Oxytocin. And oxytocin, whenever it is released, right? Oxytocin has two functions. Number one, that just in the pregnant uterus, in the smooth muscles of the uterus, they have oxytocin receptors. And just before the birth of the baby, lot of oxytocin is released from here. Remember, oxytocin is synthesized in paraventricular nucleus, but it is stored in posterior pituitary. A lot of oxytocin is released just before the birth of the baby. Then oxytocin will act on uterus and uterus will strongly contract and push the baby down or out? Down and out, right? So, that, so it means that oxytocin help in the childbirth, in the labor process. Is that right? Number two, another thing. Whenever baby suckles the breast, mother's breast, when baby suckles the mother's breast, what happens that action potential from here start? You know, mothers have in the nipple and areola lot of sensory nerve endings, right? So when baby suckles there, these sensory nerve endings are stimulated and pathways go up through the sensory pathway and eventually they are connected with hypothalamus. So what happens when baby suckles mother's breast, right, these sensation through the ascending sensory system are connected with what? Supraoptic nucleus and hypothalamus. An action potential come down and a lot of oxytocin is released. So whenever baby suckles here, hypothalamus produces action potential and releases the oxytocin from posterior pituitary and when there's more oxytocin goes to the breast and in mother breast let's suppose this is the breast and here is the milk producing unit right and this is the duct right what really happens around these milk producing unit there are special type of cells and these cells now this is a cell, we call it myoepithelial cells. And these cells have receptors for oxytocin. So when baby suckles here, sensation go to the mother central nervous system. From there, posterior pituitary releases oxytocin. Oxytocin come, release and bind here. And it stimulates these cells. And these cells contract. And whatever milk is stored here, that milk will come out. Am I clear? So in this way, mothers are not producing milk all the time. Especially, they are producing the milk all the time, but they are not releasing the milk all the time. They release when baby really put his mouth there and start suckling. But you know, mothers are very sensitive about the baby. So mother limbic system has also special neuron and circuit. You know, limbic system is 
emotional centers. So sometimes when baby just cries, or when baby, mother just look at the baby, right? So what happens when baby is crying, action potential through auditory system go to the limbic system and limbic system connection stimulate this whole pathway and release what? Oxytocin. And sometimes mother just hear the cry of the baby and milk let down starts. Why you are surprised? <laughs> you are looking very surprised. I think, okay, anyway. This is their women's business, right? And No, but you have been through that. You have been baby at least, I think in the past, right? So now what we can see that this nucleus, which is what nucleus? Para? Ventricular nucleus, paraventricular nucleus can release oxytocin which can help in uterus contraction just before the labor onset and help the milk let down. Is that right? Any question up to this? Right, so how many nuclei we have discussed in this region? What is this region? Supra optic region. Right, number one, suprachiasmatic concerned with the circadian rhythm. Anterior thalamic nucle hypothalamic nucleus concerned with temperature regulation and parasympathetic nervous system. Supra optic nucleus concerned mainly with ADH. It produces 90% ADH and 10% oxytocin. And paraventricular nuclei which produce mostly oxytocin and very little ADH. And they produce one more thing these paraventricular nucleus that is CRH. What is CRH? Corticotropin releasing hormone. That we will talk in the next, next discussion. Right? Any question up to this? No. So let's have a break. So my friends we were discussing about? Hypothalamus. Hypothalamus. That's great. So we were discussing about the functions of different nuclei of hypothalamus. In the beginning of the lectures, we discussed about uh, that hypothalamus is extending from optic chiasma up to the upper part of midbrain, which is basically up to interpeduncular fossa. Is that right? And hypothalamus has very important features on its inferior surface or ventral surface. You can say that it has a tuber cinerium, very good. Uh, and with median eminence and it has infundibulum and posteriorly it has two mammillary bodies. Is that right? Mammillary bodies. And then I told you that hypothalamus can be divided into right hypothalamus and left hypothalamus. And each hypothalamus is divided into medial and lateral part and which two structure divide the hypothalamus into medial and lateral? Fornix and mammillothalamic tract. Very good. Excellent. Right? And previously we have discussed in detail the lateral hypothalamus that we discussed in the lateral hypothalamus there were areas for anger. hunger and anger and thirst. Very good. Hunger, anger and thirst. These areas are present on the lateral hypothalamus. Right? And then we were discussing last time the medial hypothalamus and different uh, regions and nuclei contained within. Right? So let's do a little review and then we will do. Thank you. Now, now I need to draw a hypothalamus. Okay, first of all, what should be here? Optic chiasma. Optic chiasma, right? And here is hypothalamus, and this is its uh, median structure. Right, tuber? Yes. Cinerium. Here is infundibulum, which will divide into, yes, interior pituitary and posterior pituitary gland. Right, of course, pituitary gland is not the part of hypothalamus. Pituitary gland is not the part of hypothalamus. Right? Now, so this was tuber cinerium and this part of the tuber cinerium is more swollen and it is called median eminence and median eminence has a special nucleus called arcuate nucleus. Then 
more posteriorly here is yes what is it mammillary body how many mammillary bodies are there there are two mammillary bodies one on the right side and other on the left side is that right and then here is which structure yes please midbrain and pons and medulla and of course there is no fun in telling that here is your beloved thalamus is that right and what we have discussed last time that if we are if this is the hypothalamus from the this is the left hypothalamus and we can see its medial side it's the medial side of left hypothalamus is that right and we were discussing about different nuclei and first of all the most anterior region there was something here there was a nucleus here yes what is it? This is pre-optic pre nucleus, right? And this region is called pre-optic pre region. This region is called yes, pre-optic region. And if you remember, what was the main function of pre-optic nucleus? Pre-optic nucleus contained a special type of nucleus within. What was that? Dimorphic nucleus right preoptic nucleus has dimorphic nucleus sexually dimorphic nucleus and preoptic nucleus control your sexual yeah. development mm -hmm. which is under the influence of testosterone right and preoptic nucleus also releases gonadotropin releasing hormone what are what are released from here yes gonadotropin releasing factors gonadotropin releasing factors is that right they are also released from it any question up to this then more posterior medially more posterior to the pre-optic region there is supraoptic region what is there supra there is supraoptic region this was pre-optic region and now here there is another region and this region is yes supra optic region and more lateral to that more posterior to that here there is very good tubral region and here is yes mammillary mammillary region mammillary region so actually the medial part medial part of the hypothalamus is divided into four regions as you move from anterior side to the posterior side that you are moving from preoptic region to the supraoptic region to the tubural region and eventually mammillary region and one nucleus we discussed preoptic nucleus which was in the preoptic region is that right then now we are going to discuss about which area supraoptic supra region right now we are going to discuss about supra so i separate here is now your supraoptic region right now the nuclei which are present in supraoptic region in the supraoptic region nucleus which was very important and yes Yes, what is this? Uh, this is supra chiasmatic nucleus. Supra chiasmatic nucleus has a very, very important connection with the chiasma. It has a very, very important connection with the chiasma. If you know, there is one eyeball, here is another eyeball, and here is your chiasma. Now, actually, from the chiasma, there are special connections right from the chiasma there are very special connections going to which nucleus supra yes supra chiasmatic hmm. nucleus and these fibers are of course coming from retina so this pathway is called retinochiasmatic pathway 
right? And fibers, if you really want to understand from suprachiasmatic nucleus, special connections are going to, yes, special connections are going to habinular nucleus. And from the habinular nucleus, connections are going to, what is it? Pineal body. So what we can say that basically, look, retinochiasmatic pathway and from the chiasma connections are going through the avinular nucleus to the pineal gland or pineal body. Right? All this structure, suprachiasmatic nucleus, in association with the pineal gland is concerned with the control of circadian rhythms. And control of circadian rhythms. Is that right? Any question up to this? No. Right? So, and uh, one question. Normally, what are the substances which are produced by the pineal body? I'm about to be impressed by someone. What are the substances which are secreted by pineal body? You must know that. Melatonin. Melatonin. This is called the hormone of darkness. Because melatonin is produced when you are sleeping. Right? Moreover, it also produces 5-hydroxytryptamine and it can also produce pineal gland cells, cholecystokinin. And they are playing a role in circadian rhythm. Is that right? This is your internal biological clock. Right? Anyway, and you must know that two habinular Nuclei with the habinular commissure along with the pineal body hold this structure is called epithalamus. What is it called? Epithalamus. epithalamus. Is that right? Anyway, let's come back and concentrate on the hypothalamus. So there was suprachiasmatic nucleus and you know, you know the most important function of suprachiasmatic nucleus is that it is connected through the chiasma with the very special type of, yes, through the chiasma. Suprachiasmatic nucleus is connected, special fibers to the retina, right? And eventually to the pineal body. Now, there are other important nuclei also in supraoptic region. And in the supraoptic region, there is a nucleus called anterior thalamic nucleus. Now, anterior thalamic nucleus is here. Right. What is it? This is air conditioner. When you use air conditioner? When, when the temperature is hot. So actually this is anterior thalamic nucleus. Anterior thalamic nucleus is concerned with the response to high temperature. When environmental temperature is high, Interior thalamic nucleus will become active and cool down, right? So we can say, yes, please. It's anterior thalamic or anterior hypothalamic? Sorry, anterior hypothalamic. Thank you for correcting me. There was someone who was really listening with his ears. So this is anterior hypothalamic nucleus. Very good. So anterior hypothalamic nucleus is concerned. It, we also call it anti rise center, right? What this nucleus is doing that when environmental temperature is high, this nucleus activates the pathways which keep the body temperature low. They help in keeping the body cool. How? When this nucleus is stimulated, number one, you start sweating. And when you are sweating and air blows by, right, sweat will evaporate and it will take some thermal energy away. Is that right? So you can say that when you are sweating, it is the anterior hypothalamic nucleus. Secondly, it will produce cutaneous blood vessels dilation. Cutaneous blood vessels will be dilated. So that uh, blood from deeper part of the body should come more on the surface of the body, on the skin, so that from the skin heat can be lost, right, by convection and radiation. Is that right? So we can say stimulation of this interior hypothalamic nucleus can activate sweating process and it can also activate, yes, 
vasodilation. Vasodilation of the skin. Is that right? Yes. Vessels. So it is called anti rise center, or we can say the center produces response to the warm temperatures, right? Or it is a nucleus which is responsible to keep our body cool, but of course not more than another thing. This nucleus also has uh, other parasympathetic functions also. Other parasympathetic functions which are associated with this nucleus are when this nucleus is stimulated, of course what are the parasympathetic functions? Heart rate will go down, is that right? GAT activity will become more and micturation and defecation, is that right? So what we can say that this nucleus which is interior hypothalamic nucleus, this has very important function that number one it is yes anti rise center number two it is mediating other parasympathetic nervous system functions is that right so both of suprachiasmatic and interior hypothalamic nucleus are in which region medial side of hypothalamus right in which region supra optic region then there is another nucleus here and this nucleus which is present over here yes what is it supra optic nucleus and last time we were discussing about that supra optic nucleus has which important uh, this is suppose anti diuretic hormone producing neurons right and these neurons have their axons which are going to the posterior pituitary and I told you 90% of the what is that anti diuretic hormone is produced by the neuronal cell bodies in supra optic nucleus and then through the neurophysins they are going to the with the neurophysin proteins these are going in a vesicles and, and stored into posterior pituitary anti diuretic hormone and you must be knowing that when anti diuretic hormone is released in the blood anti diuretic hormone it helps in reabsorption of water from the last part of nephron and in high concentration anti diuretic hormone can also produce vasoconstriction that is why it is also called vasopressin is that right then another important nucleus which is present over here is yes what is that para ventricular nucleus and para ventricular nucleus it produces Yes, it produces oxytocin mostly, right? It produces mostly, yes, oxytocin, oxytocin and as I told you previously, oxytocin is concerned with the contraction of the uterus during the labor, right? Moreover, it, oxytocin can stimulate the release of milk from the breast, is that right? Remember, milk production is under control of prolactin. That is under control of prolactin. Prolactin is produced by anterior pituitary. But milk let down is under control of oxytocin. Any question up to here? No? And this nucleus is called which nucleus? Paraventricular nucleus. And these fibers, these fibers which are from supra optic nucleus and paraventricular nucleus these fibers are taking ADH and oxytocin and these fibers are going to the posterior pituitary this pathway is called yes please what is the name of this pathway por favor tell me this is called this pathway bundle of the neurons hypo hypothalamic hypophysial Yes, what? It is supra optico. It's supra optico hypophysial tract. What is this uh, bundle of neurons? These are called supra optico, but it has fibers from the supra optic nucleus as well as from the paraventricular nucleus. Right? So, supra optico hypophysial tract. Now, this tract is very important. Because if stock of this pituitary is disrupted, for example in some accident in head injury, if this is broken, right, still from the endings hormones can be released. Because hormone is primarily uh, synthesized in hypothalamus and stored over here. 
hypothalamus, uh, these two hormones are not synthesized in posterior pituitary, they are synthesized in the nuclei of hypothalamus. Is that right? But one very important thing that if supraoptic nucleus is damaged or hormone releasing mechanism is not working, the deficiency of antidiuretic hormone will produce a condition called diabetes insipidus. Have you heard of diabetes insipidus? You never heard of it, okay? You will hear a few things when you grow up. Right? Let's suppose this is your nephron in the kidney. Right? Your kidney has many, many nephrons like this. One kidney has about 1.2 million nephrons. Normally what happens that fluid is filtered from here and fluid will eventually appear as drop of urine. If normally if 100 ml fluid is filtered here, only 1 ml come as a urine. So out of the fluid which is filtered in the glomeruli, only 1% come as urine. Most of this water is reabsorbed. Most of this water is reabsorbed. Now reabsorption of water in last part of nephron depends on permeability of look. Now these are the cells which are present in last part of nephron which is called cortical, uh, cortical nephron and uh, cortical ducts and collecting tubules. Now these cells are sensitive to antidiuretic hormone. In the presence of antidiuretic hormone, the presence of what? ADH. ADH. In the presence of ADH, right, these cells become water permeable. Last part of the nephron become water permeable and when it become more water permeable, most of the water will be reabsorbed and urine will be very little because most of the water which is coming here goes back to the body. So in the presence of antidiuretic hormone, last part of the nephron reabsorb most of the water and urine amount become very little. So you pass concentrated urine. Is that right? Now how this system work? Actually, here are special neurons which are called osmoreceptors. What are they called? Osmoreceptors. And osmoreceptors are also present in lateral hypothalamus also. When, for example, if you are not drinking water, if you don't allow me to drink water, I'm still losing some water in sweating, some water in urine, so my blood will get start getting concentrated and osmolality of body fluid will go up. And when osmolality of body fluid will go up, osmoreceptors will be stimulated which will stimulate the supraoptic nucleus and release of ADH. And when I'm developing deprivation of water, there's more hormone in the blood, which hormone? which is against the diuresis, against the loss of water in urine, antidiuretic hormone. It will make last part of the nephron very permeable to water, water will be reabsorbed and very little amount of urine will be coming and urine will be concentrated. And when you drink very high amount of water, if you drink a lot of water, then your blood has a little hyposmolality, little diluted, then osmoreceptors are inhibited and ADH is not released. And in the absence of ADH, last part of the nephron is not water permeable. So whatever water is coming here, most of it will go into urine. And you will release large amount of urine which is diluted. Am I clear? Yes. In this way, ADH system is working along with the osmoreceptor and the last part of the nephron to control your water balance. Am I clear? No question? Okay. If due to some reason, ADH is not produced, Right? For example, there is damage in hypothalamus or anterior pituitary or pituitary stock in fundibulum and ADH is not available in sufficient amount. Then last part of the nephron are not permeable to water. So water cannot be reabsorbed from last part of the nephron. So per such person who has deficiency of ADH will, will not be able to reabsorb the water from last part of nephron. He will pass very large amount of urine, diluted urine. Is that right? and we call and he will become hypovolemic and he will develop severe thirst and he will keep on drinking maybe 20 jug of water every day and passing a lot of urine, lot of diluted urine. This condition is called diabetes insipidus. What is it called? Diabetes 
It is not diabetes mellitus. It is diabetes insipidus. So diabetes insipidus is, and because there is this type of diabetes insipidus is due to deficiency of ADH, due to damage in the central nervous system, so we call it cranial diabetes insipidus. What type of diabetes insipidus? Cranial type of diabetes insipidus. Any question here? No. Okay. After that, now we come to the, we have completed our discussion of supra optic region. Right? And paraventricular nucleus also releases one type of peptide CRF. Corticotropin releasing factor. Corticotropin hormone releasing factor. Right? This is also produced by the paraventricular. Now we come to the next area. And what is that one? Now we have come to the next area. And that is supra, that is tubural region. Now we are going to deal with the tubural region. Now this is tubural region, right? Now in this tubural region, there are three important nuclei. One nucleus is, it is like an arc. So it is called arcuate nucleus. Is it right? What is this nucleus? This is arcuate nucleus and then there are two important uh, nuclei here also and they are one of them is very very you can say right and there is another nucleus there which is uh, not very happy nucleus Now I will tell you the functions, name and functions of these nuclei. Okay, this is the arcuate nucleus, right? It is present in the swelling of tuber, cinerium, and that swelling is called median eminence. Then this is ventromedial nucleus because this was medial hypothalamus. What was it? Medial hypothalamus. It is in ventral part and this is in dorsal part. So it is ventromedial, that is dorsomedial. So there is ventromedial nucleus. And this is dorso medial nucleus. So these three important nuclei are present in tubural region. Now, actually what happens, first of all, I will tell you the function of arcuate nucleus. Arcuate nucleus has many neurons and these neurons, these are neuronal cell bodies, and these neurons are releasing their substances in infundibulum and in this part of infundibulum there is a very special of vascular very special type of vascular arrangement there are capillaries here and product which are secreted by these neurons release their product in these capillaries and from these capillaries these substances go into venous system and then they go into secondary capillary bed in interior pituitary. So what is happening? That there are there is an ar arterial system coming here, breaking down into capillaries and converting into vein venous system. This and this venous system again break down into capillaries in interior pituitary, and then again go into veins. Is that right? When this capillary network is present in between the two veins, we call it what? portal system. So this is called hypothalamic hypophysial portal system. What is hypothalamic hypophysial portal system? It's a very special vascular arrangement that there is one primary capillary set in infundibulum and median eminence. And whatever substances are secreted by the hypothalamic arcuate nucleus, these substances are taken up by the primary set of capillaries. 
these capillaries join together make the veins and these veins again break down into capillaries in this way all these product through this portal special vascular system will go to where to interior pituitary and they will actually influence the cells of interior pituitary so these product from the what is this arcuate nucleus right are taken up by this portal system brought to the anterior pituitary and anterior pituitary cells are sensitive to the product coming from arcuate nucleus is that right now actually anterior pituitary produces a lot of hormones and arcuate nucleus and other hypothalamic nucleus are producing the factors which are called release factors or release inhibitory factors for example uh, this cell is producing growth hormone what is it is producing growth hormone but actually from arcuate nucleus there may be uh, here may be what growth hormone release factor or there may be release of growth hormone release inhibiting factor which is also called somato somatostatin right so so growth hormone releasing factors and growth hormone release inhibiting factors are peptides which are produced by arcuate nucleus and its fibers and release to the portal system and come to the anterior pituitary and control the release of growth hormone then in the same way for example this is releasing yes what is it releasing let us suppose it releasing tsh tsh is thyroid stimulating hormone right so naturally then there must be some factors which are coming from here and of course through arcuate nucleus the system and that is tsh releasing factor is that right then you know that anterior pituitary cells can release fsh and lh is it right and to control the release of fsh and lh from the arcuate nuclear system and also from the preoptic nucleus there is a release of yes yes gonadotropin releasing factors is it right then if from here you have a release of yes a hormone which goes to adrenal cortex and control the release of cortisol what is that hormone called adrenocorticotropic hormone ac t h adrenocorticotropic hormone it is released by anterior pituitary so naturally then from this system through here what should be coming ac t h releasing factor or it is simply called or the same sub peptide is called crh corticotropic corticotropin releasing hormone this is produced by paraventricular nucleus as well as from arcuate nucleus gonadotropin uh, releasing factors were produced by preoptic as well as arcuate nucleus other components are coming from the arcuate nucleus then there is what we have discussed there is growth hormone release factor growth hormone release inhibiting factor tsh releasing factor or we simply call it trh what do you call it trh that is thyrotropin releasing hormone then gonadotropin releasing hormone then corticotropin releasing hormone or releasing factors remember all of them which i have written here all of them are short peptides what are they all of them are short peptide now we come to something very important that this is releasing prolactin this is prolactin producing cells they very commonly produce adenoma here a tumor here prolactin producing tumor we'll talk about that later now this is prolactin producing cells and they are under the influence of number 1 a peptide which is coming from there and that peptide is called prolactin releasing factor right but more importantly there is another substance which is 
released by these neurons. And this inhibit, this substance passes through the system and come here and it inhibits the release of pep release of prolactin. And this substance is called prolactin release inhibiting factor. Later on we discovered this substance is actually yes dopamine dopamine so we can say arcuate nucleus some of the neurons in arcuate nucleus produce dopamine which goes through hypophysio uh, hypothalamic hypophysial portal system to the anterior pituitary and this dopamine act as inhibitory factor for the production of prolactin this dopamine is acting as inhibitory factor for the production of prolactin am i clear there is no problem here right now what we are going to do that many times when arcuate nucleus is injured or this pituitary stalk is damaged dopamine is not coming here then prolactin producing cells are not inhibited and prolactin producing cells start producing massive amount of prolactin and females develop a person develop hyperprolactinemia and hyperprolactinemia activate the breast and produces milk and this is called this type of inappropriate milk production is called galactoria what is it called galactoria so what i what i said that if there's damage to the hypothalamus or anterior pituitary is disconnected with the stalk then what will happen that yes what is happening the dopamine is not not going there right so there that will lead to increase prolactin right increase prolactin will lead to yes number one galactoria galactoria number two very high concentration of prolactin will inhibit the fsh and lh production very high amount of prolactin which is produced from here will inhibit the production of fsh and lh and if there's female she will develop deficiency of fsh and lh which will translate into amenorrhea a menorrhea so this is called galactoria amenorrhea syndrome what is it called galactoria amenorrhea syndrome that female is for example there's a girl who never had a baby but start producing the milk and she develop amenorrhea maybe she is having a either damage to the hypothalamus and not not what not producing dopamine which is re and so prolactin production is not inhibited or other cause of similar syndrome may be that there is a tumor of prolactin producing cells prolactin producing cells multiply too much and inappropriately produce heavy amount of prolactin and that tumor is called prolactinoma or we call it prolactin producing adenoma what we call it prolactin producing adenoma and that produces galactoria amenorrhea syndrome and prolactin producing adenoma may grow upward and damage the chiasma and when chiasma is damaged this tumor goes up damages the chiasma that produces visual field defect if chiasma is damaged if tumor grows up right then there will be visual field defects and what really happen that these fibers from what is this from the nasal retina which are crossing through chiasma these fibers are damaged by the tumor nasal fibers so nasal retina does not work am i clear what is happening any tumor from the pituitary which goes upward may damage chiasma and you know in the chiasma fibers coming from the medial hemi retina are crossing so medial hemi retina fibers don't work and medial hemi retina fibers look at the outer side of the visual field so outer part of the visual field become blind so we call it that such person because medial retina are not working so he cannot see outer part of the visual field and we say patient develop by temporal hemi anopia by temporal hemi anopia right damage to the nasal fibers are you with me or not if you are not uh, understanding, I can explain it better. You want me to explain or it's okay? okay? It's okay for you also. Okay. So all the tumors right from the pituitary 
we should go upward, damage the chiasma, so damage the crossing fibers in the chiasma, these crossing fibers are coming from medial hemiretini, when medial hemiretini don't work, the lateral part of the visual field are blind. So we say there is lateral part of visual field is also called temporal part of visual field. So by temporal hemi anopia may occur. Any question here? No? Okay. So this was few words about the arcuate nucleus and this bundle of fibers. You know these bundle of fibers which are going from here up to where? From arcuate nucleus up to the portal system. This, this bundle of fibers is called, yes, it is called tubero-hypophysial tract because this is tubural region. From the tubural region, these fibers are going to the portal system. We call it tubero, yes, tubero-hypophysial tract. Any question here? There is no question? Now we come to this area, this nucleus. This is ventro medial and that is ventro dorsal medial very good both of them are medial but one is ventral and other is dorsal ventro medial nucleus ventro medial nucleus is basically stity center stity center when you are taking your dinner right when you are eating a time come when you don't want to eat anymore then we say you are you are having you are no more hungry Right? Actually what happened, from ventromedial nucleus, there are some cells here which are glucose, glucose sensitive. There are some other cells which are sensitive to some hormones from GIT. So these cells in the ventromedial nucleus are sensitive to the blood glucose level and also sensitive to some hormones coming from GIT. So when you are eating the food, when you have eaten enough, this nucleus is stimulated. And when this nucleus is stimulated, it inhibits the nucleus in the lateral what they are doing they inhibit the nucleus in the lateral hypothalamus or what was the nucleus here doing hunger center so this is called satiety center when you say i am sated it means you have eaten enough you don't want to eat anymore so when you have eaten enough the ventromedial nucleus is stimulated and this inhibits the hunger center and then you stop eating right and the same nucleus and neurons around this area, when they are stimulated, you feel happy or you feel rewarded or you feel player. So you can say stity center and happiness center in the hypothalamus are in the same area. In ventromedial nucleus, you have stity center and you have which center? With stity center? Happiness and reward center. Is that right? Now you have a question. Yeah, that is sensitive to leptin also, right? That we'll discuss in other series. You know, you have the concept of leptin? Okay, let me tell you. Suppose here are your body fat cells. Your body fat cell produce a hormone called leptin. It is coming from lipocyte. This hormone, this leptin through the blood can come to hypothalamus. Hypo thalamus and it adjusts the body weight through hypothalamus for example if you have too much fat if you have you are eating too much and there's too much fat then more leptin is produced leptin will come to hypothalamus it inhibit the hunger center and stimulate the stity center so in future you will eat less and if you will eat less then hypothalamus will reduce the intake of food and that will adjust the adipocyte total fat in your body so actually what happens that basically hypothalamus has a set point for your weight is that right hypothalamus has a set point for your weight for example in my hypothalamus it is set that my weight should be 70 kg now listen what happened let us suppose i become severely ill or I start very strong dieting and I lose 10 kg. I just can't dream of it. I never did it. Right. So with severe, you can say dieting, I reduce my weight from 70 to 60 kg. Then what will happen? From my fat store, leptin will become less. 
then hypothalamic function will be altered in such a way that once I finish dieting, I will be feeling more hungry and less stited and I will eat more and again my weight will go back. That is why 90% of the people who do the dieting, they have a tendency to regain the same weight which they had previously. Because every, as you know, in the refrigerator, there's a thermostat. Hypothalamus has thermostat, glucostat, osmostat, and your weight stat. Hypothalamus has thermostat. It is also your osmostat. It also has your glucostat. And it also has your weight controlling system. So actually, in everybody's hypothalamus, there is already a decision what should be your weight. When you tend to, in the long term, when you tend to increase your weight from your set point, for example, my set point is 70 kg, maybe your set point is 100 kg. Now, if both of us start dieting, I become 60 and you become 90. But once you stop dieting, I will become back to 70 and you will go back to 100. Because your hypothalamus set point is 100 kg and my is 70 kg. Is that right? So what really happens when your weight is, body weight is less than the hypothalamic set point, then hypothalamus will increase hunger and decrease satiety. Hunger center will be overactive and satiety center ventromedial will be underactive. But if you are, your weight is more than what is the hypothalamic set point for your weight, then hypothalamus will program the body to shed the weight. How? By increasing satiety center activity and decreasing hunger activity. So you understand the role of leptin? That basically leptin is a hormone produced by lipocytes in the body and hypothalamic, uh, many neurons in hypothalamus are sensitive to the concentration of leptin. If there is too much leptin, you feel more stated and less hunger. And if there is too less leptin, you will feel more hungry and less satiated. Is that clear? Now I was telling you that this ventromedial nucleus which is also stity center and also it is concerned with pleasure and happiness, if this nucleus is stimulated, what will happen? You will feel all the time stited and you will not eat more. If in an, if in an animal you stimulate this area, for example you put an elect electrode in the rat brain in this area and you make an arrangement that every time the rat or okay let me make this experiment here it's very interesting experiment here okay rather than rat we make a monkey and this is a cage right and in this cage there is an unfortunate monkey right now, if you put a special, suppose, platform here and you have a device here which is connected with the platform and from here you have connected with the hypothalamus. Now listen. Let us suppose this electrode is in ventromedial nucleus. Which nucleus? Ventromedial nucleus. So by chance, if monkey press it, what will happen? Ventromedial nucleus will be stimulated. Do you think that monkey will like to eat? No, but he will, he, monkey will feel happy. So what will happen? That monkey will feel all the time stated. It will ignore all the food, keep on losing the weight. And all the day it will be sitting and pressing it. For which purpose? To feel happiness. Is that right? So you don't need to have this cage and this thing to feel happy. You can do other things. You just eat more food and feel a little happy. Is that right? So what happened? That if ventromedial nucleus is overstimulated, you will develop anorexia. Anorexia. You will not eat anything. And if, it, if neurons around this area are also stimulated, you will feel happy. Is the right reward? And that is why in all those animals where circuit like this is established, every day, all the time, they are pressing the bars. Clear? Now, if it is overstimulated, you feel, you lose the weight and you feel great, happy. But opposite to that, if you damage the both ventromedial nuclei, can you feel, can you feel stated? Can you suppress no. hunger center? No. So if both ventromedial nucleus are damaged, you feel hungry all the time and angry all the time. And you develop savage behavior. 
you know, like angry people. Is that right? So it is true that in those rats or animal where both ventromedial nuclei are damaged, they actually keep on eating and eating and they become very much obese, overweight animal. With that, they are all the time very angry. Is that right? Usually people who are overweight, most of the time I find them very pleasant. But this will be an unusual situation that there is an obese person with lot of anger. Right? Now, this type of problem can occur due to hypothalamic injury also. Sometimes there are tumors from anterior pituitary or nearby area and these tumors go up and damage this region. The ventromedial region is injured or damaged and your ventromedial nuclei are not working, you will never feel stated and you will undereat or overeat. You will overeat and you will keep on eating and eating but you will never feel happy, you will be all the time angry and you will have savage behavior. So let me repeat, if both of these nuclei are damaged, right, then hunger centers will dominate, they cannot be inhibited and you will overeat, you will become very fat and obese, right, and you will become more irritable and angry and you will display savage wild behavior, is that right? This type of obesity is called hypothalamic obesity, what is this? Hypothalamic obesity. But in hypothalamic obesity, it is very easy to understand. If tumor is coming from here to up, look here, that will not only damage this area, but that will damage this nucleus also. Right? So gonadotropin releasing hormone will not be coming there. So sexual dysfunctions will also develop. So person who is very fat, all the time angry, if male impotent, if female galacteria and amenorrhea, maybe there is hypothalamic injury. Is that right? With that, there will be disturbed sleep pattern. Right? There may be disturbed sleep pattern. Even too much sleep, sleep episodes all the 24 hours, we call it somnolence. What we call it? Somnolence. Right? And with that, of course, there can be some other complications which I will discuss later. So you understand ventromedial nucleus? Here is dorsomedial nucleus which is supposed to balance it. Dorsomedial nucleus, when it is stimulated, you feel angry and you feel punished. So you can say ventromedial nucleus is reward center and dorsomedial nucleus is punishment center. And dorsomedial nucleus has connections with the lateral hypothalamus. Right? So, and lateral hypothalamus and dorsomedial nucleus usually fire at the same time. So it means hunger and anger are a function of the lateral hypothalamus and also dorsomedial nucleus and happiness, player and tranquility and stity is a function of ventromedial nucleus. Is that right? So generally speaking, yes, right? So now we have learned and now listen, if dorsomedial nucleus is overstimulated, you will develop wild, angry, savage behavior. But if both dorsomedial nucleus are destroyed, you will become very placid and you will become very passive and you will become very obedient. I think many wives, if they come to know, they will pray their husband's dorsomedial nucleus should be damaged somehow so that they become very much like domestic animals. You know, this is a, one of the major duty of a wife to domesticate her husband. But usually they like to go out and be wild, right? So what I'm saying that one of the way to domesticate the husband is that wife should damage the husband's ventro, dorsomedial nuclei, so they are less angry and maybe with that a little damage to the, do you think damage should be done to the lateral nucleus? No, because if damage is to the lateral nucleus then he will not feel, of course he will not feel angry, but at the same time he will not feel hungry, he will not feel thirsty and I don't think most of the wives will be that cruel. Is that right? So it is enough to damage dorsomedial and just get the male passive, but don't do too much damage because if damage extends to all this area, impotence can develop. Well Right? Now, uh, this was about the tubural region. Now, few words about mammillary region. Mammillary region has number one, a mammillary nuclei here. Mammillary nuclei here. And look, what is this? What do you think? What is it? There is a glass, there is a cup, there is plate. So it is indicating that mammillary nucleus is concerned with feeding behavior, eating behavior. Feeding, feeding, my friend. 
Is that right? It is concerned with eating behavior, okay. Eating behavior, but listen, this if you stimulate this nucleus, you stop eating. If you stimulate the lateral hypothalamus, you start eating. But if you stimulate this, you will start making the movement as if you are eating. You will start. <laughs> right? This is mammillary body. Am I clear? So mammillary body controls your eating mechanisms. Right? Uh, any question up to here? And of course, it has many other functions also. It is one of the component of the Pape's circuit. You remember I told you Pape's circuit is concerned with the recent memory and mammillary body has many more functions also. But one of the very important function of the mammillary body is that it is concerned with the eating behavior. And then another very important disease here is that in the deficiency of vitamin B1, hemorrhagic lions develop here. And condition is called Wernicke's, Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome, right? I tell you, if there's severe deficiency of B, uh, vitamin B1, this is typically seen in chronic alcoholics. If this deficiency of vitamin B1 is there, mammillary body may undergo hemorrhagic lions, and there may be degenerative lions in medial nucleus of, dorsomedial nucleus of hypothalamus, and there may be degenerative lion in periequiductal gray matter, periequiductal gray matter, and there may be hemorrhagic and degenerative lions in superior and inferior colliculi. Again, lesson. <coughs> Sorry. In sphere vitamin B1 deficiency, which is typically seen in chronic alcoholics and also seen in severely malnourished persons. If there is severe damage of it, patient may develop mammillary body, degenerative and hemorrhagic lions, extending backward these lions up to backward and upward to the dorsomedial nucleus of hypothalamus, sorry, dorsomedial nucleus of thalamus and lions extend downward, periequiductal gray matter and part of the midbrain and also what is this right and all these lions will produce clinical presentation right clinical presentation in which there are ocular palsies there are ocular palsies eyeballs cannot you know the third nerve and Fourth nerve are coming from this area. If their nuclei are damaged, then uh, oculomotor nerve and trochlear nerve nuclei are damaged or uh, conjugate eye movements are disturbed, right? That will produce ocular pulses. Is that right? Even pupil will dilate, right? Pupillary abnormalities will be seen. With that, there can be ataxia in coordination of movement. Is that right? And with that, there may be confusional state. Confusional state and especially a very typical problem that is called amnesia what is that amnesia 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 is there are two type of amnesia anti-grade and retrograde amnesia means you forget the things if I forget the things of the past it is retrograde amnesia and if I forget the things which are happening now and onwards that is Antigrade amnesia. Again, listen. For example, someone developed damage to the mammillary body one year back. Now, he, if he is all the memory before one year is before the lion is wiped out. So we call it retrograde amnesia. And even after the injury, during the last year, after the lion, he did not record any memory. That is antigrade amnesia. Because person forgets the things, so he tells you the lies. For example, you ask him what you have eaten in the morning. Maybe he has eaten in the morning uh, egg with chicken and bread. But he does not remember. So he is embarrassed. So patient will tell you, okay, I eat maybe some ice cream. If you ask him from where you are coming, maybe he is coming from hospital. But he forgot he is coming from hospital. But you try to be clever, he say, okay, I am coming from gymnasium. Is that right? This type of 
lies which patient is speaking to fill the gaps in the memory, they are given a special word. The special word is confabulations. What is that? Confabulations. So these patients with Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome, they develop amnesia and they also develop confabulations, innocent lies to fill the gaps of memory gaps. Is that right? And remember one thing very important that when you will become doctor, if a patient comes with hypoglycemia in the hospital, an old man comes with hypoglycemia, sometimes would happen. If you give concentrated glucose, when you give concentrated glucose, if person, ha if person had been previously heavily alcoholic, for example, there was an old man or young man who was chronic alcoholic, he developed hypoglycemia, he is brought to the hospital and you give high amount of glucose. When you give high amount of glucose, whatever little thiamine is present is utilized by glucose metabolism. And severe deficiency of thiamine develop and person develop hemorrhagic lesions in these areas. It means if there is a chronic alcoholic admitted in hospital, right, and he is hypo, having hypoglycemia and you give concentrated glucose, he may develop what? If his thiamine stores are marge, already very little, heavy amount of glucose going in the body, glucose metabolism will utilize the remaining little thiamine and severe thiamine deficiency will precipitate in nervous system and person will develop degenerative hemorrhagic lesions in mammillary body and into uh, thalamus, dorsomedial nucleus of thalamus and peri equiductal gray matter and superior colliculi and he will develop all these problems, ocular palsies, ataxia, confusional state with amnesias and confabulations and we say that what has precipitated? Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome. How to prevent it? Make it a basic rule. If someone has severe hypoglycemia, if someone has severe hypoglycemia and person is having a history of chronic alcoholism, Whenever you give high amount of glucose, always give it with a heavy dose of vitamin B1. This is the basic principle that anyone who comes with severe hypoglycemia and if you are not sure person has enough B1 store or not, especially in the chronic alcoholic patients, if you have to give uh, dextrose concentrated glucose, you have to give along with B1 so that you prevent this thing. Now the last few words. The last nucleus is here and this nucleus is called, this nucleus is called, what is this nucleus? The here was anterior nucleus and this is posterior hypothalamic nucleus. It has two functions. You remember anterior nucleus was anti right center. This is anti fall center. Right? Secondly, it is also having sympathetic nervous system activity. Listen now. If posterior hypothalamic nucleus is stimulated, right, it is specially stimulated when you are very cold, if environmental temperature is very low. If environmental temperature is very low, then posterior hypothalamic nucleus is stimulated and it will keep your body warm. How? It will, number one, it will give descending pathways which will go to the body and constrict all the blood vessels to the skin so that blood from the deeper part of the body should not come to the skin surface and body heat should not be coming to the skin surface so that body heat should not be lost. Again, when there is very cold environment, posterior hypothalamic nucleus is stimulated and number one it activates the vasoconstriction, cutaneous vasoconstriction so that body heat is preserved in the deeper part of the body and heat uh, uh, body heat through the blood should not come into superficial blood vessels and heat should not be lost. And if there is too much cold, then it will give pathways which will go down and activate shivering so that you will generate more heat. So when you are very cold, when environment is very very cold, what happened to you? Your cutaneous vasoconstriction occur and shivering occur. By cutaneous vasoconstriction you reduce the heat loss and by, by shivering you generate more heat. This is a function of posterior hypothalamic nucleus. Is that right? And of course, this is an emergency situation, very cold. And along with this, 
there are neurons which activate the sympathetic nervous system. So if you stimulate the posterior hypothalamus, sympathetic nervous system is activated, you develop tremors and you develop the tachycardia and you develop anxiety. Is that right? All features of sympathetic overflow. Is that right? Any question here? So it is called anti-fall center because it does not allow the body temperature to fall. Let's have a break. Now we will do a little review of important functions of hypothalamus and after that we will discuss in detail the connections of hypothalamus. Let's suppose here is your hypothalamus, right? Here are your mammillary bodies, here is your, yes, third ventricle and Fornix coming in, fornix coming in, is it right? And mammillothalamic going out. And lateral to that, here it is, what is it? Lateral hypothalamus, here also. Yes, lateral hypothalamus and this green one or no green, I should make it some different color. Let's suppose this green one. What is this? Medial hypothalamus. Is that clear? So these are medial hypothalamus, these are lateral hypothalamic area. So this is left hypothalamus and this is right and this is third ventricle. Any question here? No. Now, the functions of anterior hypothalamus, right? Okay, rather than uh, dividing into region, I will ask the basic functions. Autonomic function. Autonomic functions. Anterior hypothalamus is concerned with, yes, in anteromedial hypothalamus this hypothalamus is concerned with, if it is stimulated, it will produce parasympathetic response. Anterior hypothalamus concerned with parasympathetic response and anti-rise center. Is that right? Response of the hypothalamus towards high environmental temperature. But it will prevent the body temperature going up by producing sweating and cutaneous vasodilation. So, this is anterior hypothalamus is concerned with parasympathetic outflow and also concerned with the anti-rise center. And posterior hypothalamus, all this posterior hypothalamus from here up to here and all this posterior hypothalamus, this is concerned with anti-fall center. What is this? Number one, sympathetic. Posterior is concerned with sympathetic nervous system response and also with anti-fall center. Again, if I make hypothalamus like this, is that right? Any question up to this? Now, in this diagram, this is your anterior hypothalamus, is that right? Anterior, anterior. It is concerned with what? Parasympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system and anti-rise center. And if I talk about this part of hypothalamus which is posterior, right? And this is what? Sympathetic nervous system and anti-fall center. So it is producing what? Cutaneous vasoconstriction and shivering. And then we come to the lateral and medial. So here is the lateral hypothalamus, right? And here it is medial hypothalamus. Now both of them are controlling your body weight and eating behavior. Medial is striety centers and lateral is hunger centers. Lateral is, then medial is happiness center, reward center and lateral is anger and punishment centers. So, medial is striety 
and reward center lateral hypothalamus is hunger and anger and thirst center anterior parasympathetic posterior sympathetic anterior anti rise posterior anti fall and then we are left with this lower area what is this it is concerned with the major endo endocrine control center that here it is producing lot of you can say re anterior pituitary hormone releasing factors and release inhibiting factor which through the portal system come to the anterior pituitary any question here no problem then hypothalamus is controlling your number one body weight number two controlling your feeding or uh, eating behavior number three it is uh, controlling parasympathetic outflow it is controlling sympathetic outflow it is controlling your mood and emotions happiness sadness aggression passivity is that right then it is controlling your endocrine system then mammillary body especially is the pathway of the recent memory pathway is that right and then hypothalamus controls your sexual functions also and circadian rhythms any question up to this no so this was a little review about the functions of hypothalamus and now we come to the important connections of hypothalamus I hope you understand this diagram. Mm -hmm. Frontal lobe, right? And here it is temporal, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, parietal lobe, and frontal lobe. Any problem in understanding this? Now, this is, of course, your optic chiasma. Any problem up to here? And you are very friendly. What is it? Any question? No question here? No. Now, we have to see what are the important temporal lobe. I have just for uh, clarity purpose, actually temporal lobe is here. But I have put it in the diagram a little bit more posterior so that you can see the midbrain. Now, Hypothalamus is primarily in this area. Is that right? This is all hypothalamus. Now, what are the connections? If you try to understand with some arrangement, you will understand it well. Otherwise, it's very difficult. Let's suppose the connections of hypothalamus with the temporal lobe. Actually, temporal lobe has very important functions of the medial and inferior side of temporal lobe has very important functions of limbic system. And hypothalamus is also involved in limbic system, right? So temporal lobe should have very intimate and important connection with hypothalamus. For example, here there is a amygdaloid body here, amygdala. What is it? Magdalite body. It is concerned with sexual behavior and aggression. So do you think it should be connected with hypothalamus or not? It should be. Is that right? Then here you know that there is hippocampal formation. And here the recent memory activity is processed. Do you think it should be connected with hypothalamus or not? Yes. It should be. So let's start it. The important connection. First of all, from hippocampal formation, within the hippocampal formation, there is a special area called subiculum. Subiculum. From there, lot of fibers are coming backward, right, and contributing in the formation of fornix, right. So these are the fibers, right, and what is this? Fornix. What is it? Fornix. And fornix is the most important, you can say, relationship of hypothalamus with temporal lobe. Is that right? And in this formation of fornix, uh, right, the stages which are present over there are number one, alveus. This is sheet of 
white matter. What is this called? Alveus. Then all these fibers come together and they start in the contribute to the formation of the beginning of fornix. When they come together, they are called fembri. What is it? Fembri. And then these fembri go upward and now they have formed what structure? Of course, it's all fornix, but first part of this fornix is called crust. And then this part of the fornix is called body. And this part of the fornix is called columns. Right? So this is hippocampal formation, especially from subicul subiculum. Right? Lot of white fibers are going to make the fornical system, which consists of alveus, fembrae, crust, body and columns of fornical system. This is very important pathway. If there is bilateral damage to this fornical connections, patient will develop amnesia. Recent memory pathways disturbed. Clear? This is one temporal. Then another temporal lobe connection to the hypothalamus is from amygdaloid body. I told you amygdala is concerned with primitive behavior. Primitive behavior is sex and aggression. Sex and aggression. Is that right? So, there should be very heavy connection with the hypothalamus. Is that right? So, there's another set of connections. And this connections, which are coming here, right? These fibers coming from amygdaloid body and eventually going to the hypothalamus. These fibers are called, yes, stria terminalis. Of course, uh, the upper fibers are called, what is it? Fornix. So, fornix is connecting the hypothalamus and temporal lobe. And stria terminalis is also connecting the hypothalamus with the temporal lobe. But, stria terminalis connect the amygdaloid body with the hypothalamus. Is that right? And fornix connect the Parahippocampal formation with the hypothalamus. And what is this? Tria? Tria terminalis. Any question up to this? No. Then there is some direct pathway from amygdaloid body, right? And this pathway is directly coming, okay? from the amygdaloid body to the hypothalamus. Now there are two pathways from amygdaloid body to hypothalamus. Number one is through stria terminalis and other connection is called ventral amygdalofugal pathway from amygdalofugal. Fugal mean going away. Amygdalopetal coming to the amygdala. So amygdalo, what is this? It is ventral, ventral amygdalo fugal pathway. Now you can understand the functional importance of these pathways. The functional importance of these pathways is what? Connecting the hypothalamus and very important component of limbic system residing in the temporal lobe, inframedial aspect of temporal lobe. Any question here? No. Then hypothalamus should have some important connection with this area. What is this area? What is this? This is your frontoorbital cortex. This is concerned with your personality. It is concerned with your motivation. It is concerned with your ambitions. It is concerned with your social skills. Of course, your sympathetic, parasympathetic balance, your hormonal system, your many functions are related with the Input coming from the frontoorbital cortex. Is that right? Frontoorbital cortex. This is concerned with your personality. And of course, some people remain all the time anxious or angry. Some people are relaxed. You are getting it. And hypothalamus is controlling autonomic output as well as endocrine output. So it should be connected with frontoorbital cortex. Is that right? So some fibers from frontoorbital cortex and then from septal area. What is it? Septal area, which is also connected with the olfactory area. So olfactory area, septal area, and what is this? 
front orbital cortex, all these fibers come to the hypothalamus, connected with many nucleus of, nuclei of hypothalamus, and then these fibers are passing through the lateral hypothalamus and look at where they are going. They are going to the brain stem. These fibers are going up to the brain stem and they are connected in the brain stem with very important nuclei. Is that right? They are concerned with nucleus raphi, they are concerned with locus ceruleus, right? And many other respiratory centers and vasomotor centers and uh, many centers within the brain stem. Now these whole pathway which, which is traversing the lateral hypothalamus, right, extending from the front orbital cortex, from the olfactory cortex, from the septal area, passing through the lateral hypothalamus, connecting all the many nuclei of lateral hypothalamus with the medial hypothalamus and eventually coming to the brain stem. Who will tell me the name of this pathway? Excellent. I'm really so happy with all of you. I was not expecting you can tell me the name of this thing. What is this called? Medial forebrain bundle. Very good. What is this? It is medial forebrain, medial forebrain bundle. Is that right now? How many pathways do you have up to now? One was fornix, right? And other was, second was stria, terminalis. One was fornix and third is ventral magdalofugal, right? Then from here you are having what? Medial forebrain. Bundle is that right? Then we have connections downward from the hypothalamus, connections which are downward. You remember that there was arcuate nucleus here, and from the arcuate nucleus, there was some arcuate nucleus here, and there was a supra optic nucleus here, and there was para ventricular nucleus here. From here, there was pathways which are going here. And from the arcuate nucleus, there were some fibers, pathways coming here and eventually giving their, do you remember? Now, what is this pathway? Supraoptico hypophysial. Supraoptico hypophysial. This is the fourth pathway. And this fifth pathway is? Tubro hypophysial pathway. What is it? Tubro hypophysial pathway. Any question up to this? Now, if I tell you from parahippocampal fiber going to the hypothalamus, what is it? Fornix. Then from medulloid body going to hypothalamus, strata terminal. Medulloid body, the short route to ventral magdalofugal. From the orbitofrontal and septal area and olfactory area going through the hypothalamus lateral part to the brain stem, medial, medial forebrain bundle. Then from the hypothalamus going to the posterior pituitary, supraoptico hypophysial. From the hypothalamus going to the anterior pituitary through the vascular system. What is that? This is not going to the anterior pituitary, rather from tubural area, it is going to the infundibulum, tubro. Hypophysial pathway draining into portal system. Is that right? Any question here? No problem. Is it difficult to remember? It's not difficult. I'm myself surprised why people think it difficult. And I'm really angry when I studied this because why for so many years it has been difficult for me. Right? Anyway. So now you already know a few things. Do you remember there was a connection from mammillary body going to the interior? What is mammilla? Thalamic track. So, what is this pathway? Pathway number six. Is that right? Mamillo? Thalamic track. Is that right? Then there is another pathway, and this pathway is from mammillary body. From the mammillary body, it is going to the thalamus, but going to the dorsomedial nucleus of thalamus. What is this pathway? Mammillothalamic pathway and this is pathway from mammillary body not to the anterior thalamic nucleus rather to the dorsomedial nucleus. So who will tell me the name of this pathway? From the thalamus 
Yes. Dorsomedial nucleus. Remember from here, fiber go to the cingulate? Very good. Excellent. So what is the name of this? This pathway is inferior to the thalamus. So it is called inferior thalamic peduncle. This is in front and this is inferior and then passes to the medial. So it is called what? Inferior thalamic peduncle. And if it is inferior, where is my black marker? That has gone along with some track or what? It is in my hand? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> Actually, I forgot I have a left hand. Right? So this is the seventh pathway, right? Now, how many pathways we have done it? Let's review it. From hippocampal area, going to the? Fornix. To the hypothalamus, fornix. From amygdaloid to the fornix, long root. Slight stratuminalis. From the amygdaloid body, short root to hypothalamus. Ventral, amygdaloid. From the orbitofrontal and septal and olfactory area, going through the lateral hypothalamus to the brainstem. Medial forebrain bundle. Is that right? Then from the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary. From the arcuate nucleus to the infundibulum. Tubero, hypophysial pathway. Very good. Then from the mammillary body to thalamus. And then from the mammillary body inferior to the thalamus to the medial side of dorsomedial nucleus of thalamus. Yes, what is it? Right, right. So we have four and fifth and sixth and seventh. But there is some problem. One, two, three. And where is? This should be the four. I was thinking there's something wrong with my counting. Actually, when you learn medicine too much, you tend to forget the mathematics. Fornix one, strat terminalis two, ventral, medlite, fugal pathway three. And what was this funny thing? This is the four. Which one is that? Bundle four. And then supra optico, hypophysial five. And then tubro, hypophysial six. And then, yes, what is that? Seventh. And what should be it? Inferior thalamic potential eight. Any problem here? There is no. Are you sure? Okay. Then there are very important nuclei here. And these very important nuclei which are present here is dorsal and ventral tegmental nuclei. What is this? Ventral tegmental nucleus, dorsal tegmental nucleus. So there is ventral tegmental nucleus and dorsal tegmental nucleus, ventral tegmental nucleus and nucleus raphi. Nucleus? Raffi. It is a little superior than where I have drawn. Now from these three nuclei, there are connections which are going towards the hypothalamus. Are you understanding? From the and of course there are reverse pathway also. Right? I think I couldn't draw it well. So let's make this area a little more redrawn. Now listen, uh, I was drawing here which nuclei, dorsal, tegmental nucleus, ventral tegmental nucleus and nucleus, raphi, is that right? Now actually from the hypothalamus, there are connections going to all these three, number one, from the hypothalamus connections are going to all these nuclei and these connections which are going they are called mammillo tegmental tract what is it mammillo tegmental tract mammillo tegmental tract and what is this track number 9 mammillo tegmental tract then actually reverse fiber are also there that is from these nuclei, these nuclei going to the mammillary body. Is that right? And what is this pathway called? Which is reverse? 
that is called mammillary peduncle what is it mammillary peduncle now look how many important pathway are connected with the mammillary body first of all fornix is coming to the mammillary body strat terminalis can also come to the mammillary body and other part of hypothalamus is that right then ventro medullite to hypothalamus and mammillary body is that right then from mammillary body the fibers which are going to uh, to the thalamus mammillothalamic tract inferior thalamic peduncle inferior thalamic peduncle then mammillo tegmental and actually this should be called tegmento mammillary but it is simply called mammillary peduncle mm -hmm. any question here there is no problem in understanding it now we are left with only two pathway the fibers carrying the parasympathetic and fibers carrying the sympathetic you know that in the midbrain there is third nerve nucleus here then there in the what is the spons and medulla here is seventh nerve ninth nerve and below tenth nerve actually from the anterior hypothalamus you remember parasympathetic fiber come and they are feeding all these third nerve nucleus through dinger westfall pupillo constriction through seventh nerve nucleus superior salivatory nucleus ninth nerve inferior salivatory nucleus and dorsal nucleus of vagus and even some fiber go down up to the parasympathetic outflow going for the sacral s2 s3 s4 now this pathway from the hypothalamus you know hypothalamus interiorly was having parasympathetic functions so these are parasympathetic fibers from the anterior hypothalamus going through the what is then brain stem and specially producing parasympathetic outflow through third seventh ninth and tenth nucleus this is called dorsal longitudinal fasciculus you know it is very dorsal and it is very long so what do we call it dorsal longitudinal fasciculus dorsal longitudinal fasciculus now we are left only with one what is that sympathetic fibers so sympathetic fibers from the posterior hypothalamus right i will make it red when there is danger and from here they pass through all this system up to the brain spinal cord from t1 to going down up to l3 a2 and three lumbar two and three all fibers are going down these fibers are taking sympathetic fibers uh, which are stimulating the sympathetic outflow from thoracolumbar spinal cord is that right and these fibers are called hypothalamo hypo yeah what what should be these fibers called pole either we call it hypothalamo spinal pathways what are these hypothalamo spinal pathway because this is the most important pathway starting from hypothalamus going up to the spinal cord any problem here are you sure there is no problem now i will remove this diagram draw it again and see the how rapid i draw fastly or you recognize the bundles fastly right let's have a break so that we can rub it properly let's review a little bit hypothalamic important connections and see how good you have learned it right so let me draw hypothalamus here okay yeah, why don't know what went wrong with my drawing okay so i will draw the central nervous system here and here is the hypothalamus anterior pituitary posterior pituitary and here it is mammillary body here it is midbrain midbrain and pons and medulla is the right spinal cord and here are your okay now let's suppose this is the real point 
hypothalamus. Is that right? Yes. I will draw the pathway and you will tell me what it is. But before that, I should put thalamus also here. Right? Right. Let's pose this center of hypothalamus. Now, from the, what is this area? Hippocampal formation to hypothalamus. What is this pathway? Fornix. From the amygdaloid body, long pathway here. Stria terminalis. And short pathway here. Amygdala, amygdala. Ventral, amygdala, fugal fibers. No problem here. Then there was fronto, orbital and septal and from olfactory area passing from here and going to here. What is this? Medial forebrain bundle. And then there is a pathway from supraoptic nucleus and, and paraventricular nucleus going to the posterior pituitary. What is it? Supra optico hypophysial from arcuate nucleus going to the infundibulum tubero hypophysial pathway that's good then from here this fiber yes what is it mamillothalamic and then from here inferior thalamic peduncle very good i'm really impressed by you these are ventral nuclei uh, dorsal tegmental nucleus, ventral tegmental nucleus, raphe nucleus, right? Now, connection from here coming to all three of them. What is it? Mamillo tegmental pathway. Are you sure? This is mammillary tegmental pathway. And from here, if there's a reverse pathway going, yes. What is it? Mammillary peduncle. Then there's parasympathetic fibers from here going, yes. What is it? Dorsal longitudinal fasciculus. And then from here, sympathetic fibers going down into spinal cord. Spinal hypothalamic spinal pathway. Is that right? Now, another way just to look at as last. This is hypothalamus, which has 12 connections. Now, I will make, I will just give you a clue and you will tell me what pathway I'm drawing. Hippocampus, what is this? Amygdaloid? Striaterminalis. Fornix striaterminalis. Ventral? Ventral? Amygdalo? Fugal. And... Okay, I will draw all black so that I should see you can get confused or not. What is it? Medial forebrain bundle. Okay, then from hypothalamus going to the posterior pituitary. Posterior pituitary. Supraoptico hypophysial. And from arcuate going to the tubero hypophysial. Then from the hypothalamus going to the, from the hypothalamus, what is it? Mamilla thalamic. And what is it? Peduncle. And if this is the midbrain and pons, and from the hypothalamus to the tegmental nuclei and raphe nucleus. Mamilla tegmental. And from here the reverse. Mamilla mammillary peduncle. No problem. And then, of course, there from here, there's parasympathetic fibers. What is it? Dorsal, Dorsal longitudinal fasciculus. And from posterior hypothalamus, there are fibers going to the sympathetic. Hypothalamo, spinal fibers. How many are they? Twelve. Fornix, number one. Striaterminalis. Ventral. Okay, we just label it. Now I will label and you will tell me the name. What is it? Fornix. Number two. And number three. 
फोर मीडियल फोर मैन बंडल फाइव ऑप्टिको हाइपोफिजियल सिक्स ट्यूब्रो हाइपोफिजियल सेवन मम्मीलो थैलेमिक एट एंड नाइन एंड टेंथ एंड अलेवन डॉर्सल लॉन्गिट्यूडनल फेसिकुलस एंड ट्वेल्थ सो हाइपोथैलेमिक स्पाइनल पाथवे एनी क्वेश्चन नो लेट्स हैव अ ब्रेक now we'll talk about some important clinical correlates right first of all i will tell uh, tell you about a tumor called craniopharyngioma cranio pharyngioma now actually this tumor from where it develops let me draw first your beautiful nose and other things now actually hypothalamus is a structure here anterior pituitary posterior pituitary and what is this mammillary body and here is your what is that optic chiasma right now craniopharyngioma actually you know anterior pituitary develops from rothkes pouch rothkes pouch is During the embryon, uh, intrafetal life, Rothkes pouch is a diverticulum which is produced from nasopharynx upward, right? Now this pouch, Rothkes pouch, should eventually convert into anterior pituitary. Sometimes some of the remnants of Rothkes pouch are left there, and they become neoplastic, and they grow like a tumor. And if they grow like a tumor, they start growing upward and damaging the hypothalamus and also damaging the what is this? optic chiasma so this tumor is called craniopharyngioma so what is craniopharyngioma craniopharyngioma is a congenital epidermal tumor right which is supposed to be originating from the remnants of rothkes pouch usually it is calcified so it can be seen on due to calcification can be seen on x ray also midline right and it's the most common supra tentorial tumor in children you know there is tentorium cerebelli above the cerebellum there is a fold of dura mater so most of the tumors in the intracranial tumors are divided into supra tentorial tumors and infra tentorial tumors so craniopharyngioma is the most common supra tentorial tumor in children right and what type when this craniopharyngioma grows upward number 1 it will damage the optic chiasma and produce bitemporal and produce bitemporal hemi anopia number 1 number 2 it will damage the hypothalamus and produce features of hypothalamic dysfunction for example ventromedial nucleus is damaged and patient never feel stated so you will overeat and obese and ventromedial nucleus when it is damaged it will lead to rage anger is the right savage behavior right with that the tumor uh, what is this arcuate nucleus midline nucleus which are damaged that may disturb the anterior pituitary function and that may translate into uh, endocrine disturbances right if paraventricular nucleus is damaged and supraoptic nucleus is damaged diabetes insipidus will develop if patient is eating more there will be hypothalamic obesity obesity there will be hypothalamic obesity and diabetes insipidus too much urine dilute due to damage to which area problem with the production and of adh is the right then this patient may develop temperature regulation disturbance you understand why if interior hypothalamic region is disturbed what will happen patient cannot sweat and patient cannot produce cutaneous vasodilation so heat is accumulated in body and person develop hyperthermia so when interior interior hypothalamic region is damaged patient develop hyperthermia but if posterior 
posterior hypothalamic region is damaged, then you cannot produce uh, shivering and you cannot uh, produce cutaneous vasoconstriction. So if temperature of the environment goes down, your body temperature also goes down. You become something like cold-blooded animals. Is that right? Posterior hypothalamus is damaged. Is that right? And we say that, we don't say that you are now a cold-blooded animal. We say you have a problem with regulation of body temperature with the environment. And we call this pykilothermia. What is what we call it? Pykilothermia. Pykilothermia is a condition which result due to the damage to the posterior hypothalamus and you are unable to regulate your body temperature right in face of fluctuation in the environmental temperature. But if anterior hypothalamus is damaged, you cannot sweat, you cannot produce cutaneous vasodilation, you cannot lose the body heat, so you, you have a tendency to develop hyperthermia. And of course, circadian rhythms are disturbed, patient may develop somnolence. Somnolence, somnolence is inappropriate, excessive sleep. Is that right? And sleeping bouts all the day, and of course, in night also. Is that right? So all this situation is called hypothalamic syndrome. Person who has developed obesity with savage behavior, with endocrine disturbances and sexual disturbances. Along with that, patient has difficulties in temperature regulation and too much sleep disturbances. We call it hypothalamic syndrome. Another clinical importance, number one, Craniio, uh, craniopharyngioma. Another situation is from anterior pituitary, a prolactin producing tumor goes up. Sometimes the cells which produce prolactin, they become neoplastic and we call them prolactin producing adenoma of the anterior pituitary. Prolactin producing adenoma, it can also grow upward and damage the hypothalamus and, and chiasma. Of course, if prolactin producing or pituitary, we simply call it pituitary adenoma. Number one was craniopharyngioma and pituitary adenoma, both can damage optic chiasma. So both can produce by temporal hemianopia and both can produce hypothalamic syndrome. Is that right? Both can produce hypothalamic syndrome. But prolactin adenoma specially produces galactoria and amenorrhea syndrome. That also produces galactoria and amenorrhea syndrome and remaining feature of hypothalamic syndrome due to pituitary adenoma are same as hypothalamic syndrome with craniopharyngioma. Is that right? Let me put it here so that it become clear. Here I put craniopharyngioma and we are comparing it with pituitary adenoma specially prolactin producer. Prolactin producer. Now both of them can produce by temporal Hemi enopia. Both of them can produce bitemporal heminopia by uh, damaging the optic chiasma. Number two, both of them can produce hypothalamic syndrome here as well as hypothalamic syndrome in which person develop obesity, eat a lot, is the right, and endocrine disturbances are there, especially uh, sexual dysfunctions are there, and ventromedial nucleus damage. So, no satiety, eating a lot, obesity, and with that rage and uh, savage behavior. Is that right? And sleep disturbances. Is that right? And even mood and emotional disturbances. Is that right? Then we can come to another clinically important thing related with hypothalamus we have already discussed. That was Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome. Now you will tell me what happened in this syndrome? The deficiency of which vitamin? B1. B1. It is most commonly seen this deficiency in chronic alcoholic and chronically malnourished persons. And which part of central of a system will undergo degeneration? In Wernicke's Korsakoff. Mammillary bodies? Uh, dorsal? Dorsomedial thalamic nucleus and, and superior and inferior colliculi, especially inferior colliculi and tegmental area of the brain? stem. Now what are the important clinical features of Wernicke's Korsakoff? First of all, ocular palsies, then there is then there is ataxia, then there is confusional state, especially amnesias, anti-grade and retrograde amnesias and with that confabulations. Is that right? Any question up to this? That's all about hypothalamus. Before that I tell you, hypothalamic dysfunction can also produce 
sexual disturbances in children and adults. In children, if hypothalamus is damaged, then children may develop abnormalities of sexual behavior. Of course, children don't have much sexual behavior. What happens? That sometimes in the boy of five year old, he starts developing sexual behavior. Five year old boy gives surprises to the females around. Right? That is called precocious puberty. One of the causes of precocious puberty is damage to hypothalamus. Which area? Preoptic area. You remember that was concerned with. And in some children, look, if preoptic area is irritated by the injury, if it is irritated, it will produce precocious puberty. But if it is damaged, then it will produce retardation of sexual growth. And if you are adult and after that some disease occur to hypothalamus and preoptic area is damaged, that may lead to, depending upon if you are a man, it may lead to impotence. And if you are a female, it may lead to amenorrhea. Is that right? Little test for you. Yes. If lateral hypothalamus is stimulated, what will happen? You will feel too much hungry and angry and thirsty. If lateral hypothalamus is destroyed, you don't feel hungry, you lose the weight and you become very much docile and relaxed and passive because you don't feel angry. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. If medial hypothalamus, ventromedial nucleus is stimulated, you feel too much stity and you lose the weight. Anorexia. But if, yeah, anorexia, and but if medial, ventromedial nucleus are stimulated, you eat a lot and you become obese and you become savage behavior. Is that right? If Paraventricular and supraoptic nucleus are destroyed and ADH is not produced. Diabetes? Insipidus. Is that right? If uh, you are damaging the suprachiasmatic nucleus, disturbance in circadian rhythms. If you are damaging the interior nucleus, hypothalamic nucleus, parasympathetic outflow is disturbed and you cannot sweat and cannot and you cannot do cutaneous vasodilation. So what will be the problem? Hyperthermia. Hyperthermia. And if posterior hypothalamus is damaged, then what happens? You cannot produce the heat in the body. You cannot produce the shivering and you cannot produce vasoconstriction in the cutaneous vessels. So if environment is con uh, cold, your body temperature will also fall. We call it pyculothermia. Is that right? Any question up to this? No question? Class dismissed.